Town Hall for July the 25th, 2016, and I want to recognize that we're on the traditional territories of the Sunamo First Nations. Now, the first item of business is that uh, we're going to get a, an overview of how the Town Hall is going to work. Uh, that will be provided by Mr. Cooper, and we're going to have a, uh, a, a basically a backgrounder on the strategic plan by the city manager, Ms. Tracy Samra. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Samra and then over to Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just make a couple of introdu introductory comments about the strategic plan update and how it relates to other city processes. The strategic plan update was a decision by council to use the existing strategic plan and all of the public consultation and engagement that was undertaken during its construction and build on it uh, to reflect what their vision and values were for the remainder of their term. Uh, as part of this exercise, they met uh, over four different days between February, March, April, May, and June to review the strategic plan and some other uh, documents pertaining to capital projects that are from existing um, community plans, neighborhood plans, and other types of reports regarding uh, capital capital projects that the city's undertaken. So at the end of the day in June, uh, Mayor and Council landed on a reformatted vision statement that reflects how they value and vision uh, Nanaimo and it's built from the old strategic plan. They also reworked each of the values and changed them from um, short statements with action plans to something more aspirational. This value was important for these reasons and these are the types of things that are tied to the values. A last step of the process was to identify uh, strategic priorities for the last two and a half years of their um, term and they chose these on their own and they had a number of them as they went through it but landed on the five that are in the update and they describe what their strategic priorities are, what they mean to them and then they go on to provide some examples of the types of things that can be done by the city through its operations to achieve those strategic priorities. So the purpose of a strategic plan is to set a vision, values, and priorities. It's not a detailed operational plan that has capital assets and capital and funding put to it. It's an aspirational document that talks about um, council's view of the community and what it wants and hopes to achieve uh, over the course of their, their term. The next step after the strategic plan update is finally accepted by council is where a lot of the heavy lifting gets done. Once staff know what council's vision is and what priorities they want us to work on, as part of the 2017-18 I guess it's 2017 budget process, which will kick off in September, staff will come back with recommendations to council on the types of operational things that we can do and have been doing to achieve their outcomes. So the translation from vision and strategic priorities to actual allocation of resources, staffing, and capital projects and allocating funding for that happens during the budgeting process. And they lock in the funds for their priority projects um, during that process. So this is merely the first step of public engagement. Through um, the budget cycle starting in September, uh, there'll be a series of CAL meetings that will have staff coming forward with what their um, recommendations are for operational plans for council to consider. Projects may form part of that, and that'll be an opportunity for the public to come forward and make comments on that at that time. So there's a linkage between the strategic plan and between the annual budget cycle. So that's typically how things are done. The core services review, uh, I think its number one recommendation was that council needed to set its vision and strategic priorities so that staff and the rest of the community and stakeholders could start um, 
providing opportunities and recommendations to Council on how to achieve those. So I think to that end, I know the public's going to be engaging this evening quite extensively, but also um, stakeholders such as the Chamber of Commerce and the NIMO Economic Development Corporation are going to be coming forward and making uh, some statements as to the strategic plan update. So um, I think that's about it. I, I think the last sort of uh, comment that I'll make is, as part of the communications um, package, uh, each of the proposed st strategic priorities, like phase development of the South Downtown Waterfront, is described um, by Council. And then below that are a list of things that are in existing uh, finance plan for this year. So staff looked at its operational plan and said, what am I doing this year in the 2016 budget that can achieve those outcomes? And so this is meant as a, a sampling of the stuff that's being done by staff right now to support these strategic um, priorities. I guess the only final comment that I would make then is that um, there are strategic capital projects on as part of the update. Those aren't a definitive list of what will be done. It's not a matter of either or, or these are the only projects being done. They're just an example of some priorities that could be moved up in the year that they're funded, that they could potentially be funded more extensively if this is what Council wants to do as it goes through its 2017 to 2021 budget cycle. So they're meant there to be an example of the types of things that could be done to achieve these outcomes. And I think with that, um, I will make no more comments. Have fun. Thank you very much. Mr. Cooper. What I'm going to do quickly is take everyone through the process of how an E-Town Hall works. It's been several months since we last did one, and it's important that we lay out the process so that everyone can participate in a way that, that works for this format. So with an E-Town Hall, what we're trying to do is reach out to as many different people in the community as possible, and we do that by having a traditional town hall interface, such as those of you who are here tonight. But we also take questions uh, from Facebook, Twitter, our web form, and our phone number. And up on the screen are the different methods that you can reach us by. So for the Twitter hashtag, it's Nanaimo TH, and that's the web address for the Facebook page. You also have the web form, email, our website address, and then if you wish to call uh, the city, you can do that tonight as well. There are basically about four roles that take part in an E-Town Hall. Uh, first of all, you have mayor and council, and we also have staff here tonight that can answer technical questions, should there be any. There's a moderator and a sorter. Their job is to take all of that input that comes from those resources and send them to my role, which is the presenter. And what I do is I read out the questions that I get or facilitate questions coming in from those of you who are here in person tonight. When you're coming forward as a speaker, so those of you who are here tonight, a couple things I'd ask you to, uh, to bear in mind. First of all, uh, keep your comments focused on Council's strategic priorities update. That's what we're here to talk about. And there are uh, five of them. So the first one is phase downtown, or fa phase development of the South Downtown Waterfront, recreation, culture, sports, and tourism, public safety, governance renewal, and community wellness. When you come up, if you could initially state which of these priorities you're speaking against, and then we'll, we'll put that slide back up so everybody has the context for the, uh, the item you're talking. If you have multiple priorities, we'll, we'll put them all up. Um, and then in the spirit of having time for everyone to participate, if you could keep your comments obviously as succinct as possible, everyone would appreciate that. We have two hours scheduled for tonight's event. Uh, we can extend that longer if needed, or if, if we don't need as much time, we'll obviously end the meeting uh, sooner rather than having it continue on. And I just want to emphasize that sometimes when you have an event like this, people aren't necessarily comfortable getting up in front of the, the mic. That's why you have access to put in questions through those resources, Twitter in particular. If you wish to write something down, I have a uh, stack of traditional forms and a whole bunch of pens, you're welcome to come and talk to me at the end of the event and write down your comments, and then I'll make sure those are put into the, uh, into the, the selection of, of feedback. 
for tonight, we're basically focusing on uh, more questions than comments. Uh, we've had to date over 100 items submitted. The vast majority of those are, are comments, so members of the community commenting on council strategic priorities. Within that, we have questions and there's an obligation to provide an answer. So I'll be mostly putting forward uh, questions that, that are being brought forward and I would, I would suggest that if you have questions, this would be your opportunity for those of you who are here this evening. So with that said, are, are there any questions on, on how this works? All right, we'll start it. So if I could add, Mr. Cooper, that uh, what, uh, what we're hoping is that the questions will be short and succinct. We've got over 100 already in the queue. Uh, and as far as counsel, uh, if uh, there's somebody who has a burning desire to answer a question, by all means. But uh, if we note that not everybody needs to answer every question. Uh, the other thing... than 100, because that includes all of the comments, which I won't be discussing. Okay. The comments will be made available to the public on our website. Um, a lot of people just expressed what they thought, so we're going to focus on the questions here tonight. You know, much less questions than comments. Yes, and, and we do have some staff available that's going to help, that are going to help us with some of the answers to, indeed, uh, yeah. to some of the very specific uh, questions. Right. Well, we're hoping, Your Worship, that this is the strategic plan update, so it's a higher level. The next phase is when you go through the budgeting, because there's not going to be, you've seen the spreadsheets that were prepared, these come from existing plans. That type of detail simply doesn't exist for a number of items. They've been, they've been for the Harewood neighborhood plan, these are good ideas, you should do them. Staff have taken those and translated them to business cases or put resources behind them. The best that they've done is identified opportunities for the city to partner with other stakeholders if there's environmental issues tied to it and other issues such as that. So we're hoping that there'll be minimal use of staff tonight and it mostly be council interacting with the public. So it's on our strategic priorities predominantly is where we want to focus. Uh, before we get started, I just want to... Uh, I wish uh, Councillor Pratt a happy birthday. <laughs> Mr. Right. Cooper. Okay, so uh, given that you're all here tonight in person, I'm going to uh, put the first uh, opportunity out to engage to the, uh, the audience. Is there someone who'd like to come forward and provide a question to Council? The gentleman over here, we'll start with you. And you can just come down and stand at the podium. And unlike a traditional uh, question period, you don't have to state your name or where you're from. Just ask your question. You're good to go. This one over here. Yeah. Right there. Uh, yeah, I'm from Vancouver. New here for a few months. Uh, rent refugee, basically. Uh, my question is about Nanaimo is... It, it's, it used to be a, a resource-based area and now it's a tourism based area but from what I see what you guys do in tourism it really sucks I mean there's nothing happening the the big concert you had when you're charging people 50 bucks to get into the Chilliwack Trooper concert you close the beer gardens down at 8 30 at night where they didn't start till like 10 o'clock at night I mean this was Vancouver 20, 30 years ago. What's it's, your question? My question is, like, are you, well, what, what are you going to be doing to, to promote tourism? Because resources is, is, is gone. Tourism is all we got left. So what are you going to be doing to promote tourism? In, and, you know, do it in more of a Vancouver style as opposed to, uh, let's just close the city down at 8 o'clock at night? Thank you, sir. Uh, I do know that I was there, as was Councillor Hong, and uh, I know that there's a tremendous, there's probably a couple thousand people that very much enjoyed themselves at that event uh, that you referred to, and that, uh, and that the, um, the weekend festival uh, was for the entire community, and it was very, very well received by, by tourists and locals alike. Councillor Hong. Thanks. Well, I can answer that question for you. Um, the concert itself was privately funded, so not a dime of taxpayer money went to pay for these artists. 
mind you, it's a city park, so it's not completely free, and we did get some RCMP service. So that's why it was $50. Beer gardens closed down early because traditionally the bathtub marine festival has been terrible. 1975. Sir, sir, so sir. This is why the Bathtub Society has rebuilt the event to more of a family-oriented event as opposed to a drunken fest. Is the reason why the beer gardens closed so the families can enjoy the concert. That's my answer for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. All right. The next question I'll take from our website. So this is coming in from the web submissions. And the question reads, under the priority of community wellness, where is sustainable food support for agriculture and food production? And that would be within Council's strategic priority of community wellness. Certainly, I can read it a second time. So this is under the priority of community wellness. Where is sustainable food support for agriculture and food production? Well, I can, oh, Councillor Bestwick. Thank you. Um, I think, and just if I may, I think all questions and comments are, are welcome and some won't always be popular and some may be less popular than others, but I think it's important that we, um, that we hear everybody's thoughts and concerns tonight because that's how we learn uh, about um, what people are thinking out there and you shouldn't be guarded um, or measured or tepid. Uh, speak from your heart and speak from what you think from your experiences living in this city and how you'd like to see it moving forward. Um, the, the specific question as it relates to the entire uh, agriculture uh, improvements, if you will, is not a simple solution and it's actually it's really really complex but i think if we can move one, one thing that we are contemplating moving forward on is a farmers market that would support all of the people within the region that uh, are growers and farmers in our community and at least to start that entire awareness concept uh, of purchasing local and if purchasing local means from small business and small business in my humble opinion, drives our cities and our communities. Uh, those are the people, those folks are the backbone of our community and they, they work real hard and they roll their sleeves up. So I hope by simply the virtue of the fact that we are looking at Bevan Park Recreation Center as uh, more of a full-fledged uh, farmer's market, I hope that we can get the 10% factor where we start to purchase local and we make people more aware of how important um, that concept is. We've had that in front of us before, and uh, I shamefully would say we haven't done a very good job at it. I don't think that we've done a very good job at drilling into how we can support our local producers and our local businesses uh, better than we have in the past. So I, to me, we're moving in the right direction uh, will it happen fast enough? Probably not, but I do believe that we're moving in the right direction and that probably above all else uh, to, to start getting there and making steps. Uh, and I think that staff hear this loud and clear. I think they've heard it before. I think we're hearing it again and it's becoming far more important now than ever the way that our world is going. So um, I don't know if I answered the question, but I sure hope that we are more responsible in supporting our local uh, businesses and uh, that are in this industry because it, it's a necessity. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you for th that question, whoever submitted it. I think it's an important one. I think it's very topical, and I think it's something that is increasingly on not just the radar of Council, but the radar of our community. And I would just like to uh, add on to Councillor Bestwick's comments that I think to an extent we have uh, supported uh, sustainable um, food production. And uh, one of the first things that we did, and it started a couple of years ago, was the support that Parks and Recreation Commission gave to the community greenhouses, which are uh, relocating into Bevan Park. 
And now we have the Bedman Park Master Plan, which, as Councillor Bestwick indicates, is supporting, very supportive, of the concept of uh, the farmer's market uh, being there, and we look forward to seeing that initiative uh, proceed. So I think this is something that's on our radar, and I think we are doing what we can to support it. Thank you. Councillor Kip. Um, yeah, with our regional district partners, we've also got an agricultural <coughs> area plan that looks at all forms of agriculture and policies based on agriculture. And the uh, main mandate it was adopted in uh, October 2012, um, and it was based on sustainable practices, food growth, aquaculture, agriculture, and talking about the policies to protect that land for future growth and future food supply. So working with our regional district partners, all the municipalities in the region, we have an agricultural plan that we've put in place to, to, pr to promote food production is part of it. Thank you. Councillor Fuller. A number of years ago, Nanaimo created uh, an urban food gardens planning guidelines that uh, unfortunately not a lot of people in the community are taking, uh, taking onus on providing because it actually allows every community member who has a piece of property, whether they're renting or owning, to commit a certain amount of that property to urban food gardening and being able to sell the items from that property. So, so that's huge, and people aren't taking advantage of it. Go on the city website, Google Urban Food Gardens. There's a really cool brochure. Just quickly, urban food gardens are intended to be small-scale gardens which can be easily incorporated into a neighborhood. The size of an urban food garden is limited to 600 meters squared or 24% of a lot area where a lot is greater than 2,400 meters squared. On-site sales are permitted but are limited to no more than 60 days within the calendar year, so on and so forth. So it's a good opportunity for people to make a little bit of extra money and contribute to food in the community, locally grown, and no pesticides able to be used. So get on it. Councillor Yoakum. Um, thank you. First, I'd like to thank the viewers uh, this evening, those online and television in attendance this evening for participating in this E-Town meeting. This question around food and agriculture, on whether there's a common question, dominated our sheet here. In my view, I'm doing a quick breakdown on the subjects. So I don't have a, um, any great wisdom on how, like, how to solve it, but definitely want to let the public know, definitely a support of it. Where, like, for example, we touched on the farmer's market at Bebbin, but we've got to make sure we get also more other remote locations for around the city so not everyone can, not everyone can get to Bebbin, support that and create the space for this to happen. And also where people can or, um, organically grow food in our region. So um, my final comment on this subject would be for those that may have great ideas or any suggestions, please reach out. And this is a subject I think this council will take uh, very serious as it's a necessity in our community. Transportation costs are rising. Um, organic food is obviously the way to go, and um, so I just want to share those few comments. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Councillor Brennan. Thank you, and I want you to know I took note of your comment that not every councillor has to speak on these issues. So um, I just want to um, add to what uh, Councillor Kipp said about the agricultural um, plan that, that we have regionally. I think regionally is is the way to go on something like agriculture. So towards that end, the regional district does have um, a community advisory committee to the RDN. And it's made up of community members from um, as far up as Bowser, uh, all the way to the south, uh, the south border of Ladysmith. Um, and there are other members representing regional agricultural organizations. And interesting to me is a member representing shellfish aquaculture. So um, then the elected members are electoral area um, representatives from uh, District 68 and 69. So again, that wide range of uh, membership on that advisory committee to assist the regional district when they're making up their agricultural plan. So um, I think we take it seriously. Um, here in town, we support community gardens, we support the <clears throat> farmer's market, we support um, community kitchens, and we are a member of the RDN. And I know that the um, a former Nanaimo uh, councillor did chair the agricultural 
um, committee at the RDM. So I think we have our fingers, um, you know, firmly pressed into that pie, and we're we're moving ahead. Probably not fast enough, but I think that there is some um, energy that is is moving in that kind of quicker and quicker and quicker way. So I know there's there's um, members in the audience here who have been involved in community gardens and um, know, could speak to the success of them. So we're doing yep. okay. Councillor Hong. Um, thank you. Just wanted to address this topic because um, I come back, from, I come from a farming background uh, with my family. So I think sustainable food is very important, but I think being a farmer, isn't a very high profile job that you wish upon yourself or your family. So I'm glad that sustainable food is important. Uh, local grown food is important. And I echo what Councillor Beswick said, supporting local giving, gives the opportunity for people to become farmers um, and to enjoy what they do. And I think that's very important. I think we have school programs that have community gardens. I know I pass Fairview School every day and they have a community garden and others. Um, the YPN has done a great job turning some of the parking or the gas stations into community gardens. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't going to chime in on this one, but I, I, I hear what the uh, what the uh, the person what the person said when they when they wrote this one, and that is that you know in 1976 about 85 percent of our food that was consumed on Vancouver Island was grown on Vancouver Island. We're down to about 5% now, and we are, we've got three days supply normally on Vancouver Island to serve the needs of Vancouver Island. So we do need to look at this much more seriously, all up and down the island, <clears throat> and we need to ensure that we have proper, that we have uh, proper taxation regimes that make, uh, that make farming uh, profitable. We need to ensure that we provide services such as water at a rate that farmers can afford and an initiative that we're already working on even if you grow your crops and you've got the crops uh, ready to go you need to have a place to market it so you have to be able to present it to market and so we uh, this initiative at Bevan Park to create year-round uh, farmers market is going to go a long way to that end thank you next question all right <clears throat> I'll turn to the audience um, and again I'd just like to remind speakers coming forward from the audience if they could state which of the priorities they're speaking about. So who is available to step forward? Thank you, Mayor and Council, for having me today. Uh, my name is Andre Sullivan, and I'm the chair of the Nanaimo Economic Development Corp. Uh, I'm sorry for breaking the rules here, but I'm not going to be ask, uh, answer, asking a question, but more so uh, general comments, and I'll be speaking to all five priorities. Comments are welcome as well as questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just want to first of all commend you. I know that six months ago you were starting from a standing start in terms of the strategic plan, and it expired. And to get to the point where you have so far it takes a lot of work, it took, must have took a lot of meetings, a lot of work on staff's time. So I commend you for getting where you are and getting public consultation so early in the process. Um, I really enjoy uh, the addition of the uh, active lifestyle value and the, and the further explanation of all of them. Obviously, as the Economic Development Board, our main focus is, uh, and we're renewing our strategic plan to mirror yours, will be on the economic health side. But, that wouldn't, uh, but we can't just look at economic health in isolation. We have to recognize that they're all interconnected. One of our big priorities is to bring the average wage in Nanaimo up. And of course, that has benefits for all of the various uh, categories you looked at. I know we're supposed to speak on the five strategic priorities, and uh, please do. I have to say that the South Downtown Waterfront and the, and the potential transit hub or whatever is going to be in that space is the most exciting project in Nanaimo. Over the next 20, 30, 50 years, I think we all know that that's where the development will happen and have this kind of undeveloped coastal uh, downtown is an incredible opportunity. It's also an incredible challenge. We know there's lots of stakeholders there, and we know there's lots of competing interests, but I think if we're all talking like you guys have done so well over the last few months, we'll get to a great spot and can't wait to see what that becomes. It doesn't have to be industrial land downtown. The vision for this could be a front door for Vancouver Island, so we can ask ourselves what we want there. Uh, recreation, culture, sports, and tourism. I actually really appreciate the fact that those are all put together. It does recognize that they're all interconnected. 
I was lucky enough to be a volunteer for the BC Summer Games, and I really got to see first um, hand how recreation facilities, tourism, and community pride are all dramatically interconnected. Um, you can't measure it just for economic development or tourism benefit or community well-being. They have to be measured in all capacities, and I'm, I applaud you for taking, the, uh, taking a move in that area. Uh, public safety and community wellness are both great priorities. Again, you can't be an economic development officer. You can't grow a city unless you take care of these things. Uh, and I was already in a good place for this stuff, but to continually focus on this allows uh, the platform for a community to grow. It makes a better community. And of course, governance renewal, something that you can never finish doing, always looking about the best way to run the community. And in that um, lens, I'm looking forward to the relationship between the NEC Council and the various groups in town, all pulling in the same direction. As I said earlier, uh, you guys have just finished our strategic plan. We're going through ours in September, in large part based on some of these visions and priorities you've laid in front of us. And I look forward to working with you September afterwards and, uh, and getting on the same page and pushing towards some of these priorities and also some of these projects that you've laid out in front of us. So again, I commend you for the work you've done to get here so quickly, and I thank you for the time to listen. Thank you very much. Next question. All right, I'll take another question from the audience. You need to come to the microphone, ma'am. Otherwise, the viewers at home can't hear you. I'm Barbara, and this is Kara Anderson. Um, we are here on the behalf of community, um, um, CLBC commu um, Council that we're on, and, and uh, we have a few issues about people on disability and our rights. One is why are you changing the bus route, like from downtown to down to the waterfront? That, this can, I'll explain yeah, a little bit. Yeah. It's under public safety because right now where the bus, where all the buses come in downtown, they come in on, they okay. come, come in on Purdue and there has been rumors going around and I don't know if they're true or not, that city council and transit have wanted to change that to way, the way they used to be at one time and put them back down at Port Place. But from a public, for the both of us, from a public safety standpoint, they're better off where they are now because we have access to the police, police, yeah. police, fire department, and the, uh, and, and paramedic services. What else? Uh, there's one more. Oh, and also, just this is kind of a sideboard, but we're talking about town, and this could kind of cover all of it. Both of us are community council. We have a little, our community council at Community Living BC has a little presentation. We do, and we go out and do in the in public and whatever, and I was just wondering if you guys would be interested. <laughs> <laughs> can, can we answer your first question? Yeah, yeah. you bet, Jack. Thank you. Councilor Pratt. Thank you, ladies, for uh, coming up to the podium. Um, I, I think it's always a concern around access, uh, especially around transport and, and that kind of thing. And there has been a lot of talk around um, the bus service and where, where it would best be located. However, there are no plans at the present time. And so, um, at least not to my knowledge, there isn't. And being on city council, I think I would have heard the rumors too. So a lot of rumors are floating around right now, especially in terms of all of the things that we've put out there to the media. But um, I don't believe that there are any plans right now to do any specific changes. One more question is about affordable housing for people that are on low income and also affordable housing for people who are on a low income but on a disability. Because I know somebody who was attacked in the regular one and she's a disability person. And she had to move out. She didn't feel safe in the regular one. So I was just wondering if there's a possibility to get some made for just for disability people, for safety reasons. Yeah, because that kind of goes in as safety. the way of the public safety and also community wellness, because we are a part of community. Yeah. Councillor Fuller. <clears throat> I believe there are, there are some monies coming forward from government that are going to be used uh, in order to increase the affordable housing stock in the city. Yeah. Uh, there are some projects going ahead. Nanaimo Association for Community Living has projects going ahead. 
So more and more of that is happening. One of the things that I've been wanting to see is a strategy on affordable housing, a, a complex and complete strategy that includes things like uh, rent subsidies, includes secondary suites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're, def you're absolutely right. Um, we need more affordable housing, but we need a policy that's going to work to put that into action as opposed to just talking about it. And with regards to your bus question, yep. the one up on Prudhoe Street was always meant to be temporary. Oh, oh, no. um, yeah. Now the interesting thing is, if you put it downtown, it's easier to walk downhill than it is to walk uphill to get to one. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> but there is no guarantee it's gonna be moved at this point. So. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Thank you, Councillor Yoakum. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, is it Barb and Karen? Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah, thank you for uh, coming up this evening. Just want to quickly touch on the uh, bus. The, the bus is um, just when I got on council a year and a half ago or so, um, there were some rumblings about or some plans for the bus to go down to the pallet station, which I think those might be the rumors you may have heard. Uh, through, and this is an RDN subject. And... Um, I'm, not, I'm personally not supportive of the bus route going down there, but I think uh, we've got to consult more where the bus station may go. It's been temporary for a while, as the Gord just stated, so I just want to touch, touch on that. And also I want to just touch on um, this council and the RDN, the Regional District Board of, I'm not sure actually we did here, but at RDN, we made a motion to send a letter to the provincial government around the rates of um, CLBC clients, uh, how the the in my view, the mean spirit of provincial government was going to try to uh, claw back and, and increase those, uh, deduct from uh, CLBC clients. So we did send a letter to RDN advocating for um, the CLBC um, community. And uh, so I just want to touch on those subjects. And affordable housing is absolutely something we've got to ensure that all, um, all demographics are included, especially when people come for zoning and building apartments and whatnot. So I just want to say your, your voice was heard loud and clear, myself and... Um, and I uh, definitely look forward to advocating for, uh, this, um, for the CLBC community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. All right. Uh, I'll take this one from our uh, web resources. And the question is uh, focused on the, the waterfront specifically. And it reads, what is the status of the Departure Bay walkway? Councilor Beswick. Um, I feel like this is where we're campaigning again. <clears throat> uh, and, but not all of us need to answer the questions. Uh, the Departure Bay uh, waterfront walkway was something we discussed uh, in about 2006 7, um, way back then, uh, as a consideration. And then we had the high water mark things and, the, and all kinds of encumbrances and the uh, the bank of the Solaire residence um, property uh, going into the the uh, the foreshore and all of those things that seem to steer us away from making the departure bay connection if you will to Stewart Avenue uh, a reality and since then uh, on balance and then priorities, monies have been invested elsewhere with waterfront developments and, and Swilana and Mafeo and so on. I, I don't think that there's a person on this table that wouldn't like to see uh, the walkway extended. Um, when we spoke to the waterfront development uh, is one of our priorities. Uh, it's focus, we, we discussed that a lot. We discussed the Departure Bay walkway a lot. We discussed the improvements of the Stewart Avenue and the connectivity and on the water and up to Stewart Avenue and back down and all of those things. And we've uh, discussed them, I think, rather intently. With the Wilcox site and with the uh, South Downtown Waterfront Initiative uh, and it becoming a hub of activity, be it a transportation hub of activity and an area of growth uh, for density and residential and otherwise seemingly has become a priority um, I, I would say obviously for this council um, but I think as our city manager said on the onset 
what we're discussing with our priorities in terms of waterfront development doesn't eliminate other opportunities or projects that have been or are on the books. It just might move them up or down the queue. And, you know, we can be applauded or criticized for both or either um, approach. Uh, so I, I'm not convinced that we're going to connect Departure Bay to Stewart Avenue uh, in, in, the, in the near future. And I, but I do think that the South Downtown Waterfront Initiative um, is something where our focus is right now. Uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think that's just where we are right now. Um, if, if the monies were available and it was an easy do and an easy, simple thing without a lot of uh, DFO and ministries, and, and my guess is it would probably already be done. Um, but that's not the case. Councillor Pratt. Thank you. I'd just like to chime in on this one because I really do believe that um, the waterfront walkway is a real jewel in our community. And I do believe that um, it would be wonderful to see it go all the way to Departure Bay and all the way to this, the name of lands on the other side. Um, and we've certainly talked around this a lot, and, uh, and there's a lot of enthusiasm um, related to the um, waterfront walkway. But this is an expensive venture, and it's one of the things that we need to figure out where it fits into our budgeting, where it fits into our, uh, our priorities. And um, I don't think the, uh, the walkway is ever going to be a loss to our attention or future council's attentions, um, because I do believe it is a link that people really um, treasure. Uh, anybody who uses our waterfront certainly appreciates what has been done so far. And I do believe there will be work done in the future. When it will be done, what part will be done, that will depend on how we put our, uh, where we focus our priorities. But when you look at uh, this number one, phase development of South Downtown Waterfront, um, that could be part of it. It might not be, but um, we are really focusing on that area as one of our priorities. Councillor Brennan. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, the, 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 I agree with um, Councillor Beswick. Um, he, you know, he outlined it quite clearly. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult task. It's an expensive task. Um, and council after council has sorely wanted to do it. But it's, it's a big obstacle. Um, there are some parts, however, of a waterfront walkway that are less difficult, have less obstacles, and are more likely to be um, completed um, without the, the, the cost of the Departure Bay one. And that task will turn over, I think, to our, our staff to give us some recommendations on, on where we might be able to, to find those sections. And I think that once um, we have designated the section, we will get to, to work on it. So I wouldn't expect that it is a big, long way in the future project. I think it's one of the ones that we, we actually could complete if we choose the right section. Thank you, Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I just wanted to make a quick comment on this topic as well. I was in Victoria a couple of weeks ago and talking to a fellow there who uh, used to live in Nanaimo and attended Malaspina College when it was Malaspina. And he said he'd come back to Nanaimo recently, and the first thing that struck him, he said he just couldn't get over the improvements to the downtown area. And he said, especially that waterfront park with the double-barreled name. And I said, Maffeo Sutton. Yeah, that's it. He said, that's just wonderful. And then the second thing he said was, and I absolutely love the waterfront walkway. And he said, are you going to extend it all the way to Departure Bay? And my answer to him was, I wish we could. I wish we could do it quickly. I think eventually it will happen, but there are a lot of challenges and there are a lot of costs that have to be taken into account. So it's not going to happen in the short term, but it's definitely something that uh, this council has talked about, has identified as something to keep in mind and accomplish maybe bit by bit as we can. And, and I think we look forward all of us to seeing that eventually happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. All right. I'm going to uh, turn to the audience again. Actually, to help things out a little bit, 
I'm going to ask for those of you who'd like to speak to sit in either this chair or that chair, and that will help me process uh, who wants to talk next rather than me choosing. So I'll start with uh, right over here. Hello, hello. Why don't we all bring musical chairs? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Jen Hopi Ferguson, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the Nanaimo Child Development Center. And uh, I'm going to read a, a brief statement here, but I'm going to just share with you um, the reason for me being here. And I did submit online as well, Phil, so just in case you have that question coming up later, related to uh, inclusive play spaces. So research shows that the opportunity to play together bonds families and builds healthy social development. And I'll suggest that this falls under priority three as well as priority five. So the sport, tourism, culture component as well as the healthy communities component. Of the 200 plus parks that we have in Nanaimo, and I think from a recruitment perspective, when I was with tourism, certainly it was something we celebrated. Um, we talk about it actively. We talk about active living and being out and being active in, in the community. Only four of our parks are deemed to be wheelchair accessible, and that is does not cover the breadth of what accessibility means to the community. They are not um, for they don't it doesn't take into account physical other developments, and not one of them offers an inclusive play space for children and adults, or both, with special needs. How does council plan to investigate and integrate inclusive play? and by that I mean recreation spaces, into the recreation priorities and capital in investment plan for the city of Nanaimo. So I'm going to leave you with one quote before, if I may. Um, access gets someone in, and I think that's the difference between talking about an accessible play area or a, an accessible play space or families and grandparents and those, you know, perhaps somebody with MS or it could be somebody with a developmental delay or somebody confined to a wheelchair can come together and play together with their family. That bonds them together. Inclusion drives engagement, and it also drives active participation. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Besser. Thank you very much, Jen. Really appreciate you coming. Uh, you know, it's interesting because you asked the question, uh, you, you made a question. You said, how do we intend to improve in the inclusive playground? And we went four out of 200. And only, and those are accessible. And I use the term in quotes in terms of that it's wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair. It is not, it is not accessible to all. It is not accessible to somebody in a walker, for example, or with a mobility issue or with, you know, unaccompanied. Thank you. So, so that in itself, uh, using the example of going back to the, what are we going to do about local agriculture and so on and so forth? Awareness, doing exactly what you're doing right now at Departure Bay. The improvements there were, uh, have been, become now wheelchair accessible that perhaps wasn't in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, as our city grows and as we become more modern and more um, aware. But by doing what you're doing right now, coming and challenging and say, hey, what the hell are you going to do about this community? Did you know that you only have four? I didn't. I did not know that, um, and I, I'm not pleading ignorance, or I did not know that. And now you've just brought shame to me for four out of 200. Well, I feel a lot of shame right now in, in hearing that. And so now when we go back to the drawing board and we go back to the whiteboard and we go back to the, hey guys, what did you hear? What did you learn from our E-Town Hall? And this has an asterisk beside it for me, for whatever that means, to, because you brought something that makes a, me go, oh my God, you're kidding. And now we need to hopefully be able to put ourselves in a position for this council or a future one to start putting the wheels in motion to make four, increase it by 100% in the next two years or give ourselves some goals and some challenges. So I know Parks and Rec staff are here. I know development staff are here. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Pratt. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you, and I totally agree with uh, Councillor Bestwick. I think that um, raising awareness really, really makes all the difference. That's what this is all about. That's exactly what this is all about, this E-Town Hall. Um, we've heard several times tonight already about accessibility 
and providing proper access. We've heard it in our council meetings. We really do need to get serious about how we're going to do this rather than just say, yeah, we should do it. Of course, everybody should have access. And to say that we have 200 parks and only four of them are accessible, that's not good enough. So thank you for bringing this to our attention. As Councillor Bestwick said, now that you've raised our awareness, it's something we will be talking about. Great. Thank you. Councillor Fuller. Well, in the spirit of raising awareness, which four? That's a great question, and I don't have all of that in front of me, but I can tell you Westwood Lake is one of them, um, and that is specific to the ramp that's wide enough from a fishing pier perspective for folks to be able to fish from. The, the um, I, sorry, I didn't write it all down, but the the wheel, it's a wheelchair accessibility. That was the lens that was used to deem them, those four parks, to be accessible. And it would be fully accessible or partially accessible? Partially accessible. Okay, yeah, so wood I've, chips I've on the ground, it, yeah. so you can access... To, you can get into the park area, yeah. but you can't necessarily. So for some, let's say a parent or a grandparent who is confined, let's say to a wheelchair, couldn't wheel themselves into that play space. So the ability to route and turn around and play with their kids with wheel, wood chips or if they were in a walker, for example, would be compromised or very difficult to do. Yeah, yeah I think that's uh, one of the big things is determining what accessibility really means. Um, a lot of our parks are nature parks. Uh, mm -hmm. Colliery Dam, for example, some of it can, is accessible to wheelchairs. Actually, the lower part primarily, and and part of the wooded areas, but some of it likely will never be because mm -hmm. you've got stairways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, how accessible can we make them? We need to do a heck of a lot better, like you're saying, and like everybody on council is saying, we have to do better. I would not. Thank you, Councillor Brennan. Thank you. I'll just um, add that the um, there is a fishing wharf at Long Lake mm -hmm. that was um, built um, for disability access, and it was it was um, advanced by um, the disability community. One young fellow in particular. So that that's one more. But now my, the staff can correct me on this if I've got it wrong. But I think that on our long long list of capital priorities that we could have chosen. One of them was one of the um, beach um, kind of mats that rolls out um, to allow wheelchair access to uh, the beach. And, and so it is something that we have talked about it. It is on the radar, not necessarily way up here yet, but with the commitment we're, we're hearing um, at the table tonight, maybe that's something that will get stronger consideration in the next budget. And I, I know that our Parks and Rec um, director is here and probably knows what I'm talking about in terms of that list. So, May I, may I clarify if, if, that's, if that's okay? Um, when I say inclusive park, I'm, I, as opposed to accessible, I just want to be careful that, that we don't, that, I, that I'm clear about what I'm suggesting and requesting. And that is, inclusive parks are, are spaces where, and, and Councillor Fuller, your point is well taken in terms of, we do have a lot of nature parks, and I'm not suggesting we make amendments to those. Um, however, I do think that there's a place for an inclusive playground. And so let me give you an example. That would be a big swing that would accommodate a wheelchair, maybe two, in addition to able-bodied folks or folks who could make their own way into that swing area. It, it's a wide slide that would allow somebody with a physical or developmental delay or somebody who's unable to go down that slide on their own to go with a parent or a guardian or a grandparent or a friend. It allows kids and families who have folks that have a disability in their family, whether it's developmental or physical, and of any age, to participate and play together. It's about being active and being healthy and enjoying that bonding time together. So I just want to be clear about what I'm suggesting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kip. Uh, thank you. About inclusive and universal design, um, even in our housing projects, we should be asking for 10% of uh, this type of housing for those that have some form of physical disability or disability. And when you talk about these parks, it is having the ability to get on a swing or a rope swing with someone that is in a, either a wheelchair or needs an active device to walk with. I think the other thing people need to do, every able-bodied person should hop into a wheelchair and roll around for a while. At the Aquatic Centre, and I'm one of our newer buildings, and it's hard to get in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, we just put a, a lift in at the Frank Crane after 20-something years. And we've been looking for a button there. When the kids are all in the, the coffee shop at there, they, 
the others can't get through the door to the bathroom, and we're trying to get those things moved along. So I think it, part about education is hugely important. Hop in a wheelchair for a, a somewhere and Thanks. see how tough it is. Thank you. It's and it's you bringing it forward, Jen. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Besswick. Uh, thank you. Not to belabor this, Jen, but if you could please help um, to make our job easier, and I'm sure you have um, examples. I do. Uh, thank you. So could you I will forward those. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Before I let you go, I just wanted to say as well that uh, somebody, uh, after the long weekend that we just had with, uh, with Bathtub Festival, sent me a great picture. Um, it, was, it was interesting how it all came about, but it, was, it happened to be them. Uh, and uh, their, their, his wife had said, I want to go to Departure Bay and I want to go swimming tonight. And so she sent a picture and I realized that she went, she went swimming in Departure Bay and it's some place that's within 10 minutes of most homes in the community. And it, it, really, it really struck me when you spoke that we're missing the boat uh, with respect to what Councilor Brennan was saying, we're missing the boat on making this an inclusive community for everyone from 8 to 80 and all forms and all abilities uh, to be able to participate in the community's highlights well, just like everyone else can. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. All right, I'll take another question from the audience. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My question is, it relates to one, two, four, and five, and probably fits in the category three as well. In, especially in regards to number one, the South Development Waterfront, one of the things that we need is we need a communication with the Nanaimo First Nations. Has City Council to date met with their council as requested a few months ago? And if not, is there a plan? Thank, Thank you. Uh, I'm going to let Councillor Pratt uh, answer that question as she's on the protocol action working group. Let's move over here while you answer. Sure. Um, I, I think that uh, there is a huge commitment on the part of the City of Nanaimo to work with Nanaimo First Nations, and I believe that they believe we are working uh, well with them at this point in time. I'm on the protocol uh, agreement working group, and we are meeting regularly and uh, having some very in-depth conversations uh, relative to um, not only how they want to move forward, but how we move forward together. And, uh, and so I do believe this is something that we are taking very seriously, and, uh, and I know from the work that I've been involved with that it is moving forward. And we have met as a council um, on several occasions, and most recently was about three weeks ago? Less. Less than three weeks ago. Uh, we had a whole evening together, and there was a lot of frank discussion during that meeting, and uh, I think we are moving forward in a very productive way. Lots more to do. Thank you. Oh, Councilor Cut. There were staff meetings involved too between yes. city staff and yeah. Snanamok staff too, working on these development plans, um, not only for the South Down Waterfront, but all of our initiatives too, to look at how we engage First Nations in a more appropriate engagement. Thank you. Next question. All right, this is a question from our website, and it focuses on public safety. That's the priority. And the question reads, what is, and it's a technical question I might add, what is the nuisance designation program and what are its goals and procedures? Is it for messy nuisances or criminal nuisances? And what is the outcome for owners? Thank you, I wonder if we can get some staff help on this as well. But I'd like to start on that, uh, Councillor Fuller. <clears throat> nuisance means an activity which substanti substantially and unreasonably interferes with a person's use and enjoyment of a public area or of land he or she occupies or which causes injury to the health, comfort, or convenience of an occupier of land and dot, 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 dot. It's on the city website. You can pull up the nuisance property bylaw. It's uh, bylaw number 5645. And it, it goes through, it's not a hugely extensive bylaw. Um, and what it does is if a property is declared nuisance, 
it puts the onus on the owner of the property to take care of that. Otherwise, they will be charged costs associated with the RCMP attending, ambulance attending, fire attending. Uh, there's a whole list of uh, costs. A platoon captain for Nanaimo Fire Rescue would cost the owner $44 per hour that that person is there. Engineering Public Works Manager, $57.50. It's actually a, a, a fairly interesting bylaw. The problem I've found with it in the past is that there's no real guidelines on how it is going to be determined because you get a number of complaints and then you really have to push, push, push to get it determined to nuisance property. There isn't a set number of complaints, a set number of times the RCMP has to arrive. It varies. And I, I think we really need to look at it and, and make those concrete distinctions that if the RCMP attend a, a house 15 times in a year, then it comes before council as a nuisance property instead of uh, some coming at 8, some coming at 30. So, But it's primarily uh, designed in that manner. I hope I answered the question. I love our city website. I can find stuff on it. Thank you. I just wanted to add to that that, uh, that part of the definition of nuisance uh, properties include either activities that are on the property. They can be, uh, they can be illegal activities such as, uh, such as uh, excessive or pardon me, drugs, uh, uh, production of drugs, uh, public safety predominantly, uh, and also not uh, items of uh, activities that are not uh, that don't don't fall into those. They can be excessive partying. They can be uh, appearance issues. Uh, properties that have uh, uh, burned out buildings on them, or they're unkempt, or there's major collection of of garbage and debris and so on and so forth. Anything that brings down uh, the quality of life for the neighbors that uh, that live around that property. Thank you. Next question. All right. Far end? <coughs> Thank you very much, Philip. Kim Smythe, uh, President and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. How are you all doing tonight? Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm not going to speak to a specific uh, um, strategic priority initiative. I'm going to talk to the whole s set of them. And I'm also going to speak about the process that we're involved in now uh, to get to this point in time. Um, I'm just going to set my timer so I keep mindful of where I am. The Chamber of Commerce is here tonight to comment on the city's strategic plan update and its process to arrive at the update and to comment on the plans to move ahead with council stated priorities, projects and initiatives which were adopted on July 11th. The Chamber agrees with council that it has chose the most cost effective methods to move forward with the strategic priorities while paving the easiest path to positive progress in our city. Projects that have been stuck in discussion and study for what seemed like years now appear <clears throat> now appear as a much more realistic or as much more realistic targets on a foreseeable horizon. In staff's report to council on June 27th, a series of community values are cited at the core of strategic planning. Between 2011 and 2012, the city undertook extensive community consultation to identify the community's vision, mission, philosophies, and values. At the same time, the Chamber of Commerce, with its community partners, um, we're going through a community and public engagement process to identify how to help Nanaimo become a more successful city. Many of you participated in those exercises, which we, which we uh, uh, carried out for more than 18 months at that point in time. The chamber-led uh, consultation was added to the input that produced the city's 2012-2015 strategic plan. The summary of successful city's conclusions and recommendations was incorporated to that plan in 2012. And it's, if you reference the plan, the first reference to it is on page 10 of the original strategic plan and then goes forward and is integrated in further places and, uh, throughout the, um, the strategic plan. The summary of successful city's conclusions and recommendations was incorporated in 2012. Our own community consultations at that time more than doubled the diverse input to the city's 2012 to 2015 vision and strategic plan. I have the description or the definition of successful cities uh, showing on the screen. I'm going to quickly go through those, those, 12, um, those 12 elements that describe a successful city. I won't, I won't get into detail with them. 
Number one, connectivity, something that we at the Chamber find especially important because when we have people coming to Nanaimo from cities, other cities, investigating and possibly moving their business, moving their homes, the fact that we are so close to everything else, that we can move around so easily, that we have so many points of contact with cities outside of Nanaimo is a huge point. Spoke to collaboration. We see a great deal of collaboration going on now. We see collaboration in this room tonight. We spoke to innovation. Spoke to distinctiveness. We talked about entrepreneurial governance, which we're seeing. We're talking about master planning and community design. Quality education, so essential to where we are and what we do, especially in this community, where so much of uh, our economy and our activity depends on the school district and VIU. We talked about quality of life. High quality of life attracts investment, people, and innovation. Key to our successful future. We talked about livability. We identified social conscience as being very important to our community. We included sustainability, something that this council is working on as we move forward. We talked about a vibrant economy, something that we are working on, the Naimo Economic Development Corp. Corporation is working on. So, just to address to you and remind you that Inspire Nanaimo was the organization that was that became the legacy organization of our work on successful cities, and it is a tripartite uh, uh, organization uh, made up of the managing partners: Greater Nanaimo Chamber of Commerce, Vancouver Island University, and of course the City of Nanaimo. So we're happy to see that so much of what we had done in successful cities carries through. And we really want to see a commitment by council to, uh, to continue to, to, uh, to stay with these philosophies, to commit to the philosophies, to continue to integrate them in your strategic plan going forward. So it wasn't really a question, it was a, uh, a plea to council. Can you stay with this? Can you st stick with it? And we thought it was a fantastic um, uh, contribution to the community at that time. And if anybody wants more information on it, there's the website address right there. And I thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you very much. Councillor Bestwick, do you have questions for the delegation? Yes, please. Real quick, Kim, thanks very much for coming forward. Uh, how many members are on the Inspire and Nanaimo? I apologize, I don't know how many, how many members. It's, it's rather fluid. We've gone through a couple of different incarnations with Inspire, trying to find out where it's going to fit at what it's going to do. We didn't want to be another organization that established monthly meetings of fixed individuals and I had to go someplace to find a budget to do things. We're more of a, a thinking organization that tries to find inspiring things that are happening in the community or create inspiring things to happen in the community. And then we work with other organizations in the community to put those into place. So at any given time, there's maybe 10, 12 of us that meet to discuss these things. Sometimes it gets a little bit bigger, sometimes it's a little bit smaller. But at the core, of course, is the city, the chamber, and university. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Six. you, sir. Thank you. Next question. All right, there's a gentleman here. You're welcome to come on up. Me first. I can take it. Excuse me. Hi there, June Ross, and thank you for holding the uh, E Town Hall. I've got a couple of questions and I guess a bit of a comment as well. Um, I'm wondering what it means in uh, number two, recreation, culture, sports, and tourism, when it talks about provide a major boost to downtown revitalization by supporting the creation of a sports and entertainment center. What does that mean, supporting? Councillor Bestwick. Well, I'll, I'll do my um, very best to try to provide you with what I believe to this point in time to be support. Uh, and in that is A, support means that it's on our list to investigate a sports and entertainment center possibility with uh, and I think somebody mentioned something in one of our questions here that we all have online. Um, 
be it private, public, or a partnership, or you know, a combination thereof. So when we're doing our inventories, and this is, I think everything that we're doing, everything that is on this list of five and the list of 100, and it's a fluid list, is forever changing and forever a work in progress. And the work in progress is to identify how do we provide uh, entertainment, sports and recreation, arts and culture, private and public, for that QOL thing that was just up there a minute ago, the quality of life. And the quality of life for, in a broad scope of how we can best invest in our own city while using private people and private properties and, and what is it that we need to do first, second, and third, fourth and fifth. And if one of those things is to ins inspire a private-public partnership that invests private money, public money in a major project that will, in my opinion, and I make no apologies for my affinity for sports and entertainment, and I don't think anybody should make any apologies for what their passions are, that a sports and entertainment complex which engages culture and arts and fine arts and kids and grandkids and I realize all is of a that, draw. Yeah. I realize all of that, but I'm wondering what it means to support. Does it mean that it's a taxpayer that is going to have to pay even a portion of it? Would it then go to I, referendum? Sure. I would, would it like go to referendum? That's all I want to know. I don't know. We're not at that stage yet where we're going to be able to commit uh, how much money uh, is going to be spent or not be spent or whether it's a uh, referendum or not a referendum. Uh, w w this is at the high level of, this would be asking me the question, how much money are you going to spend on the waterfront walkway improvement down at the South Downtown Waterfront Initiative and what is it, by the way? I wasn't I asking for an amount. I was just asking what support meant. Did well, it mean then that it's the tax? We're going to try to attract private development to bring forward a proposal that we can disseminate and determine whether it is a, an attractive proposition or not an attractive proposition. But we're not we're we're not there yet. Uh, just for an example, Frank Crane Arena, Bevan Park Recreation Center, is nearing 50 years old. So at some point in time, whether we agree with sports or I don't like hockey or there's too many ranks or it's or whatever, at some point in time, we have to start thinking about replacing Frank Crane Arena. So whether we pay for it or whether the private people pay for it or whether it's a common, we better start thinking about it because in three years it's 50 years old and tired and there's no entertainment going on there and there's no activities going on there and it's a 2,240 seat arena that started out at 2,755 seats in 1974. So fast forward to 2016, nothing gets built in the next three to four years, 2020, we're 50 years old and if we wonder why entertainment and activities and trade shows and boat shows and home shows and conventions and all of those things are skipping Nanaimo, it's not the only thing and it's not the only reason, but it's part of it. And we have to replace those facilities. Recreation is a mandate that we have to, we have to replace them at some point in time. So where is it? specifically in terms of the financial commitment and who's paying. Those are the things that we have to roll up our sleeves and work real hard on to ensure that the taxpayer pays less and not more. Those are the things that we have to really work hard on. And that is, I can tell you right now, that's what I'm committed to. 
If we, if we build whatever it is that we build, if we build another rehearsal hall, Port Theater over here, I, I want us to build a rehearsal hall over here. We dedicated $4 million to that. We have $4 million on the books to build that rehearsal hall. Uh -huh. I sure hope that the private or the operator with their private counterparts can raise the monies so we can provide that four million bucks and build that. I hope we can attract people that feel as passionate about the city of Nanaimo as you and I do, that we can attract them to invest in Nanaimo in that area, that area being sports and entertainment and recreation and everything else that goes along with it. I hope we can find a partner. And finding partners to dance with when you're talking millions and millions and millions of dollars isn't uh, an easy task, it's challenging. So will you be um, updated when we're updated? Absolutely, 100%. Better be. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for the explanation. Anybody we've else? Other, we've got other speakers yet. Okay. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there's not too much I can add to that. Uh, but uh, thanks for the question, Ms. Ross. I guess I would answer your, your, your specific question by saying, in my mind, the word supporting means investigating. And that's where we're at right now. This whole process has been a process of uh, identifying visions of individuals and collective count, uh, collective. Uh, uh, a council as a collective, and it's been a process of looking ahead and trying to determine where we want to see our city going in the future. And this idea of a sports and entertainment center has been talked about and kicked around for a long time. We decided to put it on paper as something that we might be interested in investigating because eventually maybe we want to go there. Do we know if it's going to cost X amount of dollars? No, we don't right now. Do we know if there's partners that are going to be interested in that project? Hopefully there will be, but we're not at that point yet. Uh, is the community interested in this project? Hopefully, from my point of view, hopefully they are. But we're not even at that point yet. So it's the idea we want to put it on paper. It's an exciting concept that some of us at least, and I think most of us, see as a vision for the future. We want to investigate those possibilities. So beyond that, it's not specific. That will all come, and there will be pl plenty of opportunity for, for your comments and feedback as we well, proceed. I was just going to say investigate would have been a better word to have used than to support. I wouldn't have been up here. And that's just my word, and others yeah. might not agree with me, but that's okay. what I would suggest. Okay. Councillor Fuller. One of the biggest mistakes we ever made in this town was when uh, we were building this place and we decided to rip out the Civic Arena, which uh, was a 5,000 seat arena that was used for concerts, used for skating. Huh? It was only about 1,000 seats. Was it? Okay, it was a big arena that was used for. <laughs> Concerts, uh, skating, rollerblading, you name it, it was used for it. And it was tore out simply because uh, we were going to put up a couple of massive condo towers down at Mafia Sutton Park. So sadly, that would have uh, served a bit of a purpose up until now when we have this idea. Everybody knows that Howard Johnson has put out a, a thing saying that they might be interested in doing something. Well, it doesn't matter whether it's the Howard Johnsons or anybody else who's interested in doing it. They likely will need the support of the city, whether that's through tax uh, write-offs. Uh, I'm not sure if they're included in the DCC thing. So those are some ways that we could support. Are we going to do a $72 million or a $52 million that expands to $72 million that expands ultimately to a $100 million commitment on the part of the city? I don't think so. I think we made that mistake once. And Not I, without I, a I, referendum I, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't think a referendum would go through again. However, you know how that one worked. We didn't think it would go through with this, and it did. So 
So there's lots of different ways we can support it without having to funnel mass, mass quantities of monies and taxpayer dollars into it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bestwick. Thank you. Um, just, I, I don't want to dance on a specific word, um, whether we support it or whether we investigate it or whether we do research on it. But what it means is, is that we have to do work on it. So we, we might get come back and say we don't support it because it might be too expensive. It might be, who knows? But, you know, whether we support it or investigate it or research it, I think we have to do all of those things. Because if we're not going to support it, then let's not put it on there. If we're not going to support investigating and researching how we might be able to find ourselves in the 21st century, like every other city in the province with over 90,000 people in it, then we, we need to start thinking about that stuff. Because if we don't start thinking about it and researching it, investigating it, see how much it might cost in five or ten years, or whether, I mean, we can't go backwards, so we better figure something out how we might be able to address a replacement. This is a replacement. We're going to have to replace Frank Crane Arena. Frank Crane Arena isn't staying there forever. And Civic Arena was 1,640 seats, and it accommodated about 2,200 people for an event. Uh, in the downtown core on a very small footprint, which uh, somewhere near its 50th birthday, we banged her down. And we could have used that floor space. Trust me, we could have used that floor space in the last 10 years since it's been taken out. But nonetheless, it, it's research investigation and to determine whether it fits into our scheme of okay. priorities. I understand now, Bill. I understand. I just wanted to know what support meant because that's research very, and investigate the opportunity. That's fine. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, under number five, community wellness um, in infrastructure. Does that also include our drinking water shed? I don't know why it wouldn't. Do you have any more questions, Pam? Yes, I've got one more comment here. Um, back in this document, there's a whole area called environmental responsibility. Um, that wording is absolutely superb, and yet, under the governance removal, the new committee structure removed an environmental committee, and I think that's a very bad mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kep. Um, just on the structure of the committees, an interesting one. Um, a long time ago, and I've helped with some of these, the Social Planning Committee and the Environment Committee. What I always found with them and why I support this idea of spreading the environment, getting them out of one little caucus where they speak to the converted every day in their little caucus because they're all very environmentally sensitive. Um, now they're going to speak to people with a different mentality or a different sort of uh, cultural design. They're going to sit with the social planners and they're going to have environment people there and they're going to have development people there. So they can talk about the whole spectrum of our community in that context. So that's one of the reasons where I support it. So by this talk about we're dismantling the environment committee and dismantling these, no, we're starting to embed them into all of the organizations. So we're embedding the view of environment. We're embedding the view of social planning. We're embedding those in other communities that didn't even care that environment was on it. When I talked with the Development Process Review Committee, we talked a little bit about environment. There wasn't an environmental person there. So I think people have got hung up on a couple of points or a few people's comment that we're destroying the environment committee. My gosh, I don't think any of this table wants to. I want environment in every thought pattern we do. I want it in development services. I want it in transportation. I want it in social planning. Um, I want it in the theater group. So that's to me, we're not just blanking out, closing down the environment. We're embedding it in every part of our operation. And to me, that's my point on when I hear that we're closing them down. Just to finish off then, Jim, thank you for that. Um, I don't 
agree that you're embedding, what you're doing is diluting. You're di diluting a committee that was operating very well, and instead of taking that committee and using them with the other departments, what you've done is diminish their voice. Well, again, I, I would suggest I haven't seen a lot of reports come from the Environment Committee that had massive impact on us. We've been waiting for the sustainability checklist. I think I, I was on the committee four years ago, and it still hasn't made the table. And that's what's a problem to me. Those committees work great within themselves. They function great. Everybody's a buddy. They go out, and it didn't get deeper into the organization. It's, so it's a, a change for me that is very well received, in my view. Thank you. Councillor Fuller. I'm, I kind of like the way that this uh, committee is going to be formed. And I'll, I'll give you an example of why I like it. Passive housing. It's the most environmentally friendly form of housing that you can do. The first one that we will have that I know of in this city is an affordable housing complex. Wait a minute, social planning. My God. You're involving the environment and social planning. So it can work. You can actually accomplish things. There's a group that uh, I believe uh, June is very well aware of, the Vancouver Island Water Watch. I believe they have done far more in this community and on Vancouver Island for issues around uh, water and drinking water and other issues with regards to water than our environmental committee ever did. So. When we can look at bringing in groups like Vancouver Island Water Watch to these broader groups, when we do look at the environmental issues, I think we're way ahead of the game. Down the road, we may find it doesn't work and we may go back to it, but that's the whole thing with the process. We're doing it, and we're going to get some good stuff out of it, and I see the passive housing as being the first one. Thank you. Councillor Kipp. Oh, no, 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 no. Hey, Councillor Bestwick. Thank you. Just um, if I might offer my two bits worth. Uh, like not unlike the social planning department that really has one member of staff in it that that carries a huge load and social planning maybe 10 or 12 or however many years ago may only have have deserved one or two or members of staff. And it was about five years ago. And, and now I think we're, when we get into this next budget cycle that we're going to be talking about staffing levels and we're going to be talking about the core services review and we're going to be talking about how they I indicate to us that we may wish to beef up certain areas. Uh, and I think that we can get a lot of mileage out of uh, increased staffing levels in certain areas that warrant it, that we need it because we have some shortcomings and, and maybe uh, intel and all kinds of good things that can come out of it. And I don't think that the environment is any different. I don't think that we have perhaps enough uh, staff in the environment department. And there was not long ago, we had a full-time environment officer. And not long ago, a previous council chose to remove it. And then with pressure, came back as half time. Uh, and so things change, times change. I can tell you right now, and I, well, I won't, that the argument that was provided why we could get rid of an environmental officer is because the, the developers were going to be able to use QEPs. Quality professionals reports on riparians and bird nests, and we don't need our our guy. We're just going to have the developers go out and bring back their report, and that's what's that signed off as good enough. Well, as far as I am concerned, yeah, we do need our own environment officer, maybe in plural. And maybe we better roll up our sleeves and invest more money in that department. And I can tell you right now that I didn't feel any differently when it was taken away. So through time, through change, through bad experiences, through good or bad decisions, everything is fluid and everything on balance. And here we are, 
And I think we have a great opportunity as we're going into this next budget cycle. And that's why these events are so important. And people want to come and talk to us and add more police and add more fire and add this and add that. We'll not, we'd like to do it all. But on balance, there will only be certain things we can do. And I think one of the very first speakers that came up said, we won't be able to do all of this fast enough. Guarantee it. But as long as we're moving in the right direction, that, that is what's important. Because then the community is going to see us. We're going to build confidence that we're moving in the right direction on all of these things. But we're not going to be able to do them all to 100% capacity all at once. Councilor Yoakum. Thank you. I just wanted to state that um, the environmental uh, subject coming from uh, my previous role in population and being a SNAML member is um, coming from a background where your environmental concerns were not heard surrounded by booms and mills and this and that. So I get the environmental concern, the lack of drinking water out there in IR, IR, out in Cedar, IR 2, 3, and 4, no drinking water until recent years of trucking in water. So I get the water concerns. I get the lack of basically being disrespected and mistreated environmental concerns. So I would not sit here and, not, and put a blind eye to environmental concerns. I think we're strengthening by putting in older committees, and I like Councillor Bestwick's um, comments around maybe we do need some environment officers again. I wasn't aware they used to have them here. So I just want to touch on that, those, those couple points, and some of the language, and since we did a community, community, community uh, restructuring, it was about like, we're not concerned about the environment, or some of us aren't concerned about the environment, is absolutely false. And um, I'm definitely going to advocate and make sure environments um, implement in all our committees. Thank you. Thank you, Council Brennan. Thank you. Um, I think we do need an environmental policy or an environmental committee. The reason I think that is because um, if you look at the record of, this, uh, of the environmental committee, you'll find that one of our, our most important environmental documents is our sustainability policy. And that was tasked to the committee, and the committee came back with um, an excellent sustainability policy, which we use in the city on a regular basis to do to um, help us guide us um, along in, in our development. The um, the federal government made some changes to um, streams and river protections that. Um, we, as a municipality, said in our environmental committee, these po this policy that the federal government has made is leaving our streams at risk. So we came to council, and council directed that committee to develop a, a riparian policy. They worked with um, the staff members here. They worked with developers, and they worked with the... Um, the creeps, as, as Bill was saying, the uh, biologists who do the work for the developers. We talked to them and we found certain things. We found that sometimes those uh, creeps felt some, a little bit constrained in the kinds of recommendations they could make. And they wished that they had broader powers. They didn't have them. So our committee um, put together a, a riparian policy. We took it to the committee of the developers who were looking for ways to um, to speed up development so that it didn't take so long and to, to get rid of obstacles. We took this uh, riparian policy to them and the first time we took it to them, they were prepared to endorse it. So there, it was a really good way of um, smoothing out relationships and working relationships between what may have been seen as opposing factions. I think that, um, oh, and the other thing that came out of the riparian policy was a recommendation that the city hire back the, um, the um, biologist in the bylaw department. So uh, we did that, so we beefed that up so that, because people didn't have trust in uh, um, a creep who was hired by a developer to say, yeah, this is good, go with it. They wanted an independent um, set of eyes, 
instead of skills, to look at that um, uh, development plan and say, yeah, I think maybe the QIP is right in this area, but I, I think it should be strengthened here. And people have more faith when it's an independent biologist looking at, at uh, a, a questionable piece. Not to say that they don't have faith in the QIPs as they are, but when you, you, you would bring in our biologist when there was questions. I think that when you take one person and plunk them down on a committee that, whose specific focus is not the environment, then their weight is reduced. The weight that they have to make changes and to hold the city's feet to the fire is reduced. We know that for, we use that uh, word tokenism in all sorts of different areas when we think that having an individual represent a point of view on a committee of 10 other people is not going to be successful. That's why I think that we do require uh, a standalone environmental committee. And I, I, I thank um, Ms. Ross for asking that question because um, I think it, it gave, gave me an opportunity to put my thoughts together and to outline why I think that it's, it's essential that we carry on with an environmental committee because when you have individuals sitting on a committee that they don't much know much about and trying to make a point of view um, take hold, it's more difficult than you have a group of people brainstorming, putting together a solid piece of work, present it to the city and say, this is where we need to go in our environmental work. And the city will generally accept that. But if it's one lonely little person, one lonely little green person, calling out, in my view, into what could be the wilderness, it's not going to work, and it's, it's going to hurt us. Because people come to this island, they come to Nanaimo specifically because of our environment. Thank you, Councillor Hong. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't actually see that as a view. I think that the Environment Committee is a strong committee. If you have an A-team committee, why not spread those people to other committees to make sure that those committees have a point of view that they don't traditionally see? And we do look at everything that's related to the environment that is a key for now. It is a selling feature. Developers know that. The design panel, when we make deliberations on design, we look at those things. And now that if you're going to put some other people that are from the environment into these committees, it's still in the forefront. It's constantly reminded. It's not one-tenth of a person. I will listen to everybody's point of view. And if they tell me it enough over and over again, it will get into me. It might butt heads, but I will absorb it. And they do make good points. So having that, I don't see it's going to be a problem. If there is some issues that we want, it's council's discussion and our discretions that, hey, let's strike a select committee. Let's form some people. Let's find out what we can do to solve this environmental issue, if we have this issue, like water. Something comes up, we have the right and the discretion to form this to get an answer that we need. So it's not like the options are gone. They're still there. Thanks. Thank you. So I wanted to uh, just wanted to suggest to council that uh, looks as though we're getting some second time speakers here that uh, we're here to try to answer the question of the person that came to the podium. So if there's any other further answers to the question that was at the podium as opposed to a debate. Um, okay, we've got other questions. Yeah, we've got other questions here. Can we have the next question, please? Good evening. Thank you for the invitation for public input. I think it's welcome, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, so I'm a Nanaimo resident, and I envision myself continuing to live in Nanaimo, and I, I think that there are many things that we can improve on in, in this city, but I'm wanting to focus primarily on agriculture because 
Um, that's how I make my living, and um, we have a really big opportunity to rebuild the agricultural economy on Vancouver Island because we have a year-round growing climate. And agriculture is something that um, has the greatest potential to heal many of the faults we've, you know, created. So um, food is something we all have in common, but we've become kind of complacent because access to food has become easy in the grocery stores. Uh, I value Nanaimo for prioritizing health and wellness, but I'd like to invite local food to be considered as one of the most important aspects of community development and public health. So food as public health. Um, as mentioned by Councillor Beswick, uh, planning for sustainable agriculture is a complicated task and it will require multifaceted approaches. So it's the access to land, access to water, access to making a living wage and ability to earn a living. Um, the city could help on several of these factors through a municipally supported agricultural policy and I recently went to a workshop where some council members from the city of Richmond were attending and Richmond is doing some really amazing things with their agricultural policy. They're, they're buying up land and they're um, making one acre parcels available to lease to, to small scale farmers and um, myself personally I know I could earn an income on one acre of land and one acre of land can feed approximately 15 people. If, uh, if, the, if it's intensive, intensively grown agriculture. And um, also on these municipal land, municipally supported agricultural plots, um, the city is able to get carbon credits from uh, trees being planted and um, it goes into the ALR, so it's tax, tax status. And on some of these plots, they're um, doing cross-pollinating with other things, so with like housing, and education and uh, marketing and um, you know right now we're we're growing a raw product we're growing vegetables to go to market and if we could grow vegetables to go to a kitchen to be value-added to go to market then we could get potentially ten times more value from some of our food and then we could start exporting it and because we have a year-round growing climate um, you know, we could just start opening up more and more farm sites and this thing would kind of snowball. But right now we're kind of at the saving agriculture stage. There are so few farmers involved and the challenges of access <coughs> to land and ability to make a, to earn a, a living um, are kind of the barriers. So if there is an initial support where land is offered and there can be all sorts of different partnerships through not-for-profits, um, partnerships with the university, um, you know, uh, summer programs where a job is created for a farmer to bring kids, um, agricultural tourism. Um, <coughs> there, there are so many different things. And what I really appreciate about Nanaimo is it's small enough of a city that, um, <coughs> you know, a, a groups of people can make big changes. And so myself and our farming colleagues and our friends, we're always thinking, okay, what does Nanaimo need? How can we make the city better? If we're gonna live here, you know, we want it to be a great place to live. So um, we're excited to get more involved with, with uh, civic politics because, you know, federal politics, Ottawa is far away. <laughs> and uh, you guys are like, here we are having a conversation. So um, uh, I think that's kind of all I wanted to say. I mean, I could go off. Oh, and then um, Nanaimo could have a food security officer. How about that for a job? A food security officer, which is a, which is a, a new position. Viha. <laughs> thank, th thank you. I just wanted to say to you that uh, that uh, Richmond's done a wonderful job of, of preserving their agricultural heritage. Over fifty percent of that uh, municipality is still agricultural, and they very much, despite all of the development. Um, if if you were to take, and that's not an idea, if you were to take that one acre plot in Richmond, could you afford to live there too? If and I... Could you afford to live in Richmond off the income off of a one acre plot? Well, that's why I live in Nanaimo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's why I choose to live in Nanaimo. Um, oh, and I, there's another thing. I wanted to uh, thank everyone for the work that's going on towards the year-round market in Nanaimo. Um, 
in order for us to build capacity, we need that market. Because right now, we're basically bringing it and setting it up three days a week. And if we had just a space, we could keep it and it was available to the public six or seven days a week. We do so much better, so quick. Thank you, thank you. Councillor Bestrick. Thanks, thanks for coming. Um, quickly, what is your number one crop? Like what is what is it that you do better than anybody uh, else? What's, what do you do best? Rainbow carrots. Rainbow carrots. Garlic. Cool. 12 months of the year. Uh, 12, 12, well, we're a market gardener, so we're working with the seasonal cycle. So right now it's full on, everything's ready. But in the winter there are 40 or 50 different things that we could still have growing. Plus, you know, if there was a space where we could store our food, um, like all our squash and roots and garlic, and um, then we could store it for the winter. If, it, if there was a facility for us to store it properly. That's another conversation. That <laughs> we're, we're like working on, you know, we've got a 90 year old barn that's our main workspace, you know, like, it's like you said, the public infrastructure here needs restoration and um, so does agriculture, you know. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Kip. Uh, thank you, Farmer Brown. I appreciate what you do. Um, thanks for coming forward. Urban gardens are a concern for me when we put a limit of the size of them. You can have 100% of your yard in grass, but only 25% vegetables. That always shocked me. I didn't like that we did. What help do you need with water and water supplies and the co cost of water? That's our most important resource, without a doubt. It's expensive. Everybody wants it, but farms need it. Um, what can, do, do we need? A, is there any place like Richmond special pricing for water supply? Um, assistance with water gathering, like giving you metal sheds, metal roof, hold the rainwater, uh, put it back into the system as you can when you need it. Um, what type of help do you see? Like from a municipal point of view, we're trying to get down to what our legislated services are so that we know what they are, our mandatory services from the government, our discretionary services is where we have some flexibility. And of course, we have foundational work, fire, police, and those. And I think food needs to be a foundational thing on Vancouver Island. Um, do you know of any places that are giving discounts for farmers for water, um, helping with uh, infrastructure for water collection or anything like that? Or if you don't know, you can help us search those out. I, I don't really know. I know a lot of water is grandfathered into um, like land usage. And, um, you know, my friend who's an urban farmer uses city water. But he uses it sparingly because he has to pay for it. So, That's what I mean. For growing, you need water. And if it becomes too expensive for the farmer to grow with the water, then we're in a problem. So this could be something that the city could offer for f agriculture, but also for sustainable initiatives, um, tax breaks on cisterns and um, infrastructural upgrades to be more water uh, smart. So it's, that's the whole cross-pollination thing because we need, you know, it's not just one thing, it's many things all working together to support each other to bring everyone up. And root cellars. You need a massive root cellar. If there was a community food storage space, you know, we're you know part of the what we're dreaming for this. Go bust in this market Deepen bunker. Go, <laughs> go open up that deepen bunker. <laughs> that thing's still there. It's a huge concrete structure that's sitting there, closed underground, three stories. Sits there, federal. Make a great, great bunker for food. Thank you. I can see no further uh, okay. questions for you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Cooper, uh, we're getting to the end of our evening. Uh, the, the timeline for the broadcast is for 9 o'clock. Uh, at your discretion, you're welcome to continue this beyond 9. Okay. What is council's will? Okay. Carry on. And for how much longer? Another hour? I recommend. Okay, so we need a motion to uh, to go beyond our, our predetermined time. So can we have a motion for something? Councilor Yoakum. Make that motion. What's, what motion is that, Councilor? Oh, I like to, in my motion. I like to have a time frame of um, whatever time frame the council agrees on, but also a rescheduled one ASAP. Okay. If that makes sense. It wasn't very articulately said, so make a motion to carry on tonight. 
but also to reschedule an, another town hall meeting. Actually, let's get through this one. I'll make another motion after this one. Okay, so yeah. there's a motion on the floor to continue with no time, with no time frame. So I heard Jim say an hour. Thanks. Sure. Uh, is there a seconder required? No. <laughs> so at this point, at this point, we've got no seconder for an hour. Do we have another motion? Okay. I'll second that. Councillor uh, Kip and seconded by Councillor Bestrick. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Your we'll wish. carry on. Yeah. Just would like to point out that there's one agenda item. The city's representative to the Nanaimo Port Authority. She's been here uh, since 6.30 waiting to speak, so maybe... Um, at 9.15, she can do her presentation if there's not, not a lineup of people. Certainly. As it stands right now, we're going, we're, we've got a motion on the floor that's been passed for 9.30 at all. Okay. Kelsey Yoakum. Just quickly, um, I don't know if this will be a motion or just direction. I'd like to make uh, um, just a suggestion to have a, another town hall e-meeting ASAP, but also at Verrett various locations around the city, at, um, like say, where we got facilities and have uh, that true town hall feeling, besides out of this type of setting, thank you. And so sooner than later, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. All right, I'm gonna ask the uh, lady at the far end there to finish up the, the wait she's been on. Hi. Okay, a lot of people care here tonight, and I know you guys have a hard job. Um, with such a very variety of people and ideas in Nanaimo. I'm going to go a little bit big picture. When I looked at your uh, strategic plan update, um, you first mentioned the community values, and then when I looked at the council priorities and saw two, recreation, culture, sports, and tourism, the thing that I am most concerned about and I see a lack of is a fair... Uh, geographically equ equitable neighborhood parks because they're just not equally spread throughout the city. Um, of course, they're not equally spread where I live in Harewood. I clean houses and every time I look on Google Map for some home I haven't been to before, I see green space, green space, green space, green space. It's like they're surrounded by green spaces in the north end. Um, if you guys you're dreaming big here, nice aspirations. And I know that this is what this is about. You can't say, yes, we're gonna give you four parks in this neighborhood and we're gonna give you wheelchair accessibility and we're gonna move this bus stop. I know you guys can't say definitely all these things are going to be done. But I just wanna point out that neighborhood parks for everybody where you can just walk to it, where you can see your neighbors, where as you're walking you can pick up litter, where it can keep people in the community involved with their neighbors, keep people in touch with the seniors, with the, with the locked in, with, um, it encourages four of your uh, community values, environmental responsibility, parks of course would do that, social equity. It almost like to a T is fulfilling some of the quotes you guys have under social equity, like treating the most vulnerable with dignity and acceptance, providing fair access to uh, resources, encouraging full participation in all aspects of community life. So I don't see um, why it should be not put more concretely into Nanaimo's future community plan that parks happen throughout the city. And I actually had like four pages of stuff to talk about, but I'm trying to be very succinct, and I know there's lots of other people that are wanting to talk, so you guys don't have to all answer me, because I know there's no like for sure yes you can give. But I just want to know and bring it out that it's on the radar for Nanaimo to um, get some more parks and areas that are not served. It's not just my neighborhood. When I look on the map, I see other ones that there's no way you can walk that far with a toddler. And not every home can afford two vehicles or has the time to do that. So that's my concern. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Hong. Um, thank you. I wanted to address some of that. I think if you watched last week or the prior one that um, there is a huge park right behind 
um, RSB school. We're investing a lot of money into it. We just finished the water park on it. We are going to put a BMX or uh, a skate park in it. Mm -hmm. We have the only covered, we're planning on a covered arena or a playing field or play space in it. Um, as the CDC before you presented, we have 200 parks in Nanaimo. The so to say, oh, Child Development Center. Yes. So no, I know. she discussed the accessibility issue. Um, so there are a lot of parks, and, and I believe that they are spread everywhere. You just don't see playgrounds in all the park spaces. Um, I think is probably what you're asking for is a more playground or actually green space. There is. And we usually get parks... 5% of the land is usually donated from development to yeah. a park. So if there isn't big development and it's all privately owned land, we can't really expropriate their land if they don't want to develop it. Oh, no. So, I'm, not, so, I'm not suggesting and, that that happens. And I know that there has been development in the Harewood neighborhood on 3rd and Wake Kasaya and uh, now again on 3rd and Wake Kasaya and the ones going in in 8th and 9th. And the park that you speak of that is being built where the skateboard park will be happening and all that wonderfulness, it's 1.1 kilometers from my driveway to its parking lot. So although I see there are parks around, they're not always easily walkable. Like I've heard a minimum, I'm not an expert in any of this, but I've seen different things that said a minimum 800 meters walking. And if there was, I don't even know on who, who on staff would be um, knowledgeable about that, but we can see parks. And there are cat stream parks near my neighborhood they're blackberries and creeks and gullies, which is great for wildlife, which is very important. But it's not going to let little kids go play. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to respond to this as well. Uh, and I wish we had a map in front of us that did show us where our parks are, because I'm, I'm frankly surprised at, at your comments. I think, as Councillor Hong has indicated, there are a surprising number of small uh, parks in all areas of the city. Uh, we do have some very large parks, and the improvements to the Harewood Centennial Park behind John Barsby are very exciting. But there are lots and lots of small community parks. And our goal, in fact, our stated goal, is to have a park uh, within a five-minute walk of any location. Uh, and one thing that I would uh, mention is, uh, and I think it's an excellent program, what we call the Partners in Parks. Yeah, I know. Where I know if there is an undeveloped piece of land which has been designated for park, but there's maybe no playground equipment on it, and the community wants to see some improvements to that uh, small park, then that can be brought about in a partnership between the city staff and the community and, and help to, to develop what the community wants to see there. So uh, I think there are a lot of small parks throughout the city, including in the Harewood area. There's many that I didn't know were there until I heard of them and investigated. Um, so like I say, I wish we had a map here. I wish too, because if you looked in between 3rd, 5th, Wake Asaya, and Bruce, there's the ball field across from the old Harewood school. And Pat's stream parks. I certainly totally agree with with yeah. your statement that parks are very important and community parks are important. They are a, a social gathering place for a community, and I would like to see as many as possible. And uh, I'm not saying just more, more, more. I'm saying look at the maps and see where they are and put them where they are needed. I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Point taken. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Brennan. Thank you. Thank you for, for bringing this up because I had um, an experience, or I have this experience every time I go to Coquitlam to care for my grandchildren when their parents are working. And one is two and one is four. Um, the four-year-old could probably walk to the closest park, but to drag the two-year-old along, it's, it's just not, um, it's not, realistic so I just I just wonder if a young parent's eye sees things differently than than an older demographics eye and an older demographic might say there's plenty of parks 
because they can walk there. We have a two-year-old, and you're trying to walk that same distance. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So I have a suspicion, and I have no evidence to support this, but I think that there's been more prolific development in the north, and that generates the top lots, and that Harewood in the south end may not have had that same requirement. And so we don't have this, the same numbers of small neighborhood uh, little parks for kids. So I think we need, we need to look at things through that eye as well. And I thank you very much for bringing this up and, and because it confirms my experience just um, last weekend. So I think you're, you're on to, to something and we, we should pay attention to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to say that uh, you may have brought something up that just ba that's based on the history of the development of Nanaimo, and that is that uh, a lot of the areas in Harewood were developed, you know, decades ago. The approach up in the north end has been in the last 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So in that 40 years, there's been a lot of changes in the, in the approach. And I was well aware of what Councillor Thorpe had said with respect to the desire to have parks within five minute walk for anybody mm -hmm. and it may very well be that you've just pointed out something that most of us weren't aware of with respect to the development that happened 60 70 80 90 years ago in one of our sections of our community thank you for that thank you thank you thank you mr cooper all right i'm going to read a uh, question from the web and the focus is public safety and the question reads, public safety includes places like downtown parks and playgrounds. Security is non-existent in downtown parks and playgrounds. Why is there no security on the list? I wonder if we can have some, uh, some staff help on this one with respect to the comments made with uh, that security is non-existent in downtown parks and playgrounds. Councillor Thorpe? Well, I'll start. Uh, Chair, but I'll start by saying that I, I can't agree with that statement. Uh, virtually every time I'm downtown at one of our uh, parks, I notice the uh, RCMP bike patrol quite regularly uh, making their rounds. Um, of course, they can't be everywhere, and we have our bylaw officers who respond mainly on a complaint uh, basis. And again, they can't be everywhere, so I, I suppose uh, the bottom line for this is it comes down to staffing levels. Um, I, I have not had anybody say to me that they felt our downtown parks were unsafe. I know it's always a challenge to deal with some of the behaviors that happen, and uh, the drug issue is always uh, present. Uh, but I, I would disagree that security is non-existent. And I, I really do applaud the efforts of our uh, bike patrol for the work that they do. And I think there's only a certain amount they can do, giving their resources. Uh, so again, that's something that uh, is a budget item, and it's something uh, that uh, can be kept in mind. But that would be my response. Thank you. Your Worship, yes, I can agree with that. So we do have bike patrol. Uh, they are downtown. That's where they spend the majority of their time. For the last several years, we also had a foot patrol that was dedicated to walking the downtown area. So in that regards, we do what we can in the parks and in the downtown area. Thank you. I, I would further add, just because Richard's in the audience, that park staff regularly go through in the morning through the park areas and are checking on things as well. Thank you. Councilor Fuller. <clears throat> It's interesting, uh, Councillor Kip just mentioned something, roast out the homeless, he says. <laughs> now, now, the reason that's interesting is uh, there's a couple different groups of people. It's, it's culture, there's a culture out there. Uh, the drinking homeless tend not to want to be in a public place. So they will go down to a place like Piper's Park, which is out of the way, away from kids. 
drug users and drug addicts will shoot up wherever is convenient. It might be behind a building. Pauline Herrera's school has been having a huge amount of problems with the park down below there. So the RCMP increases their patrols. They increase their presence in the areas when they become aware of them. Deverell Park up in the south end had a huge problem at one point. The more people that use parks, the less likely there will be for, for that behavior to happen in parks. So it's, it's, a, it's a conundrum. Sure, you could hire security, but what's security going to do? Call the police. So a citizen can call the police, and they're not going to cost us 30 bucks an hour. So it, it's an interesting uh, idea, but I do think our parks are served, and the more the community makes us aware of it, the better served they are. Councillor Pratt. That was my point that I was going to make um, as well, Councillor Fuller, and that is that the more we are aware when people don't feel safe and they can be specific about why they don't feel safe, then we can address the issues. Um, I know I use the parks downtown and I use them very early in the morning um, and I'm talking like 6.30 in the morning and I never have felt threatened at all in, in the park downtown. Um, but that doesn't mean that other people don't feel safe or do, you know, are, are having an issue. And I th would encourage the public to notify us when they, when they do have a specific issue because then we can address it and then we can make sure that we're watching. Um, and I think that's exactly what the RCMP want us to do. Thank you. I see no further speakers. Mr. Cooper. Okay. And the next question is also from the, from the website. Just, just for public on that one, um, we have 880 hectares of park in Nanaimo, 12 dog off leash, 173 kilometers of trail, two outdoor amphitheaters, 70 playgrounds, 25 sports fields, including two artificial turfs, 30 ball diamonds in Nanaimo across our community, 880 hectares of park. So, you know, some of them are very big, but I think the thing is that we've had is in the older areas, we haven't brought the new standard of parkland acquisition into some of the older areas. And that's something I think the, the person, really we can address is possibly purchase or more. And we've left money and we, one of the key things we looked at is parkland acquisition. And I know Councillor Hong really has pushed for that acquisition land. And I, but we do have a fair lot of fields, but do they meet the needs? Are they accessible? Do they have accessible play areas in that? And that's, I think, where we're heading. I really appreciate the input tonight. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. Okay, I'll, I'll read another one from the web and then I'll turn back to the audience. This uh, topic is on community wellness. And the question reads, it is well documented from international studies that bike routes need to be physically separated from car lanes Will this occur here? And again, that's on community wellness. Well, as a member of the, uh, of the Transportation Committee, I know that we have uh, <clears throat> discussed that numerous times. And we, have, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, there is a secondary uh, bike uh, cycling network in Nanaimo that is planned to be next phase. However, uh, there's a lot more work to do. For example, Hammond Bay Road. People tell us that they, uh, that they absolutely feel unsafe on Hammond Bay Road when they're cycling. So we're going to have to look real, real hard and carefully at some of our major thoroughfares. Uh, as far as the separation from car lanes, that is absolutely uh, being discovered around the world that one of the reasons why people do not do not use the cycling infrastructure that may or may not be in place is simply because they don't feel safe. So we have to create, uh, we have to do a better job of creating a, a feeling of well-being while they're in there using these, these facilities. I don't see anyone else. Hi there, my name is Matthew O'Donnell. Um, I have a suggestion, and I guess it's just leading into a question about uh, your pillars. It's about the uh, environmental uh, committee, like uh, Councillor Brennan was uh, talking about earlier. I personally, as a private citizen, I really feel it's important to have a standalone environmental committee. While at the same time, I totally understand what Councillor Kip and what Councillor Fuller were saying as well. 
Uh, one thing that actually uh, kind of stuck out in my mind was two weeks ago uh, when uh, this discussion was happening, uh, Councillor Fuller, I'm paraphrasing here, but said something to the effect of, uh, you know, the environment affects everything. Um, you know, it's obviously in 2016, we have to be very environmentally conscious, so it would make sense to me for there to be like a, a viewpoint, I suppose, of the environment in every committee. But at the same time, I think it, there should also be a standalone environmental committee. I think it should be both, I, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and, I, and I can't really stress that enough. I really, really feel that the environment is very important. And I guess that suggestion to maybe do, maybe look at both ends and try to figure out a compromise to have the committee, but also have uh, a presence on all the other committees, that kind of segues into your actual five points in general. Um, I believe that, well, let's, let's look at the first, uh, the first point. I believe it was uh, improvements to the uh, south end uh, waterfront. That's a very specific point, and I think that's a very valid point. I think that should be a priority of the city, but it's very specific. And then when we mo move to uh, point number five, uh, community wellness, it includes uh, bike routes, um, the environment, poverty, economic accessibility, all very important issues, but I feel as if they were, you know, this is a guess, but I, I'm guessing that the first four, they're very specific. And then number five, you had a laundry list of other very important issues, and you just kind of group them into community wellness. That's what I believe. Uh, but, and, I, and I think that that's not beneficial to our city. I Going back to what I was saying earlier about how, you know, some issues, such as the environment, that would affect all, all things, I suppose. Uh, but I also don't believe that environmental uh, issues and poverty are directly connected. I think they're indirectly connected, but I don't believe that they are directly connected. And I do agree with Councillor Brennan in the sense of, you know, if someone says uh, their expertise is uh, theater groups in Nanaimo, I, as a citizen, I really don't want, th I don't think that they should be having a, as a direct role in something like, say, the environment or poverty as someone who with more education would be. I know I'm rambling here, so I do apologize, but um, I guess that's what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest there. I just, I, so my question here, it would be for the community wellness thing, uh, could someone in council or, or could someone answer what a, a key priority for this city would be for uh, poverty and fighting actual poverty? Hmm. Like an actual specific strategy that you have. Uh, mine's employment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Working on, I'm on the agenda. agenda. Councillor, we've got to speak on this. Councillor for. Okay, I'm going to hit about three other things you talked about, the environmental committees. Uh, Ms. Samra, could you uh, explain how the city is going to be working with the RDN and working with yada, 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 yada? Okay. Uh, how does the environment fit in with social planning? I gave a perfect example, passive housing. Uh, BC Housing at one point mandated that all of the affordable housing in the province that they would be funding had to meet certain LEEDS standards, environmental friendliness. And the, with regards to poverty, one of the things we're looking at is an affordable housing initiative and a, a complex strategy on affordable housing. So I'm not just going to look at gee, affordable housing, it's going to look at the secondary suite policy, it's going to look at density bonusing. We have one of the most difficult uh, means to get density bonusing that I've seen. It's, you've got to meet seven different criteria. So no one really goes after that density bonusing. What they do is they come to us and ask for a variance and we usually give it to them. But what do we get out of it? That's the thing. So. The affordable housing initiative is, is going to be key to addressing poverty on all levels. Uh, homelessness, low-income wage earners, single parents. It's, it's going to be huge. People with disabilities. So that one is going to be huge. And I believe Ms. Samara is going to answer the last question I mentioned with regards to the environmental work, the city, RDM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera are going to do. Ron. Thank you. Um, I'll just 
note that uh, staff are working with the other stakeholders uh, at a, another working group, but um, in the in interest of time, um, we're only going to 9.30. There's another agenda item, which is the presentation from the Nanaimo Port Authority uh, delegate. I'd be pleased to have this discussion at the next um, okay. e-town hall that we're doing. And there's going to be one that's uh, connected with the committee structure as well. Uh, probably not until September because uh, people have been advising it's better to consult with the community in September than it is in August. So we're pushing it off until then, but then a fulsome uh, session just on that. Thank you. Just a super quick follow-up on that is that that committee that they're forming with all the professionals will be able to bring in other environmental professionals into it when needed. So it's covered. It's going to be covered big time. and. I'm sure we'll see that. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for clarifying. Oh. We do have other uh, do we have other speakers, but we're going to have to wrap it up pretty quick. We've got uh, we're at nine eighteen right now. So, Councillor Brennan. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Um, the interesting thing about the environmental committee is that the when the committee was struck, um, members of those committees were also assigned to other committees that would require an environmental lens. So the, the committee that uh, Councillor Hong was talking about, the um, Design Advisory Committee, there is a member of uh, the Environmental Committee who sits there, who's been appointed. They come back and report to us. So somehow they sit in on it, and that may be it, may be sitting in on At any rate, those things can happen, and because I agree with you, it is important to have an environmental lens on those committees that require it, but not at the expense of the full environmental committee. On the issue of poverty re reduction really is what we would be looking at. Um, it, it, poverty, poverty is um, a result of not enough income. Income is the, the most serious issue for people who, who live in poverty because by definition they don't have enough money. We can't do a lot about that. That's a federal and a provincial responsibility. But what we can do is try to alleviate the effects of poverty and by, by providing, by ensuring that your, in, your family income doesn't stop you from um, get, gaining access to, I've written them down, access to services like recreational services, um, the pool, um, our, our parks, you know, enough throughout the city so that everyone gets to recreate. Um, we can ask that um, an amenity for a large enough development that's going to have a number of uh, houses, houses in it or townhouses or condos, um, that there be space for child care centers. Because child care centers are what affect your income. If, if you can afford your child care, then your income is, is not as severe. It's not as severe a problem. Um, so we should be looking at those kinds of things. And there, there is a, a joint committee among the city and other organizations and individuals who are looking at poverty reduction planning. And those are some of the things that they're looking at. Access to education is another thing, but it's not something we can probably have a lot of impact on. But we have to understand that income is the issue, and that's outside our jurisdiction. But we can, we can attack the effects of poverty. That's what's really important for us at this level, in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Yoakum. Just quickly, in respect of the speakers and time, um, thank you, Mr. Donald, for coming up this evening. Just uh, quickly on poverty is um, um, the role of Councilor Brennan. We can't do too much, but nonetheless, we can do a lot. For a simple fact is um, uh, poverty is, uh, is driven by mental health, addiction, job creation, and, and, and fair wages. So mental health and addiction, is a, in, 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 my, in my experience, in my day job, is the main cause of, of poverty. But nevertheless, um, what we can do today would be, um, whether someone's in poverty, they, we, we got to make sure people that are struggling behind that threshold, uh, that threshold are living with dignity. And some of the homes these people have to reside in breaks my heart. Some of these apartment complexes, which I won't name for legal liabilities, but should not even exist. So we have to pull our socks up. And there's one... Apartment. I've named numerous times at council, which this saddens me. 
but nevertheless, I can go on and on about that. So that's my quick piece on poverty in a snapshot. In regards to the Environmental Committee, is I look forward to hearing, this is where relationships and partnerships are key to, yes, we have a community that will work, whether we want lead standards for this development or um, waste and whatnot. I totally understand that and respect that. But and also at the same token is um, the key, the strongest relation, strongest environmental movement this council can have is a relationship with the POG committee, and and the POG committee has been dormant for unfortunately too many years until recent. That's with the SFN, and SFN and a partnership with SFN and a true, real, meaningful relationship is our biggest ally and strength in environmental because we all know from the reform the. The conservative government, the, I forget what bill it was, where it basically wiped out a lot of environmental rights. So the only environmental rights really much at that level in this, in this neck of the, in our world is the First Nation rights and here in this city, the Douglas Treaty, where overflows go through SFN. So if there's concerns, that the, whether it's fisheries, water, or whatever it may be, the referral process would go through the POG, they should, maybe should make that part of your POG committee discussions. I'm not on POG. But nevertheless, that'd be a suggestion, and, and being in relationship with them is our strength, biggest strength in regards to the environmental concerns, which this, which people would bring forward. So I just wanted to touch on 100 miles per hour. Sorry about my pace here. I feel a little bit of pressure here. So I just want to share those comments. Thank you. I appreciate the clarity from everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We're running to 9:23. I have two more speakers: Councillor Kip and Councillor Bestwick. Triple bottom line accounting. You know what that is? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Triple bottom line accounting. You yes. Know what it is? And it usually is in context of all together. Yep. You judge social, environment, and your, your um, financial things. And they, they're usually judged together now. Not separate in isolation. No one isolates their environment committee anymore. They're putting it together. <coughs> Triple bottom line with governance and organization and operations built into it. So putting them together. Equity, environment, finance, all in one. Because what we get, the environment committee has some great ideas. They're environmentalists. But there's no pricing attached to it, no thought of cost, mm -hmm. maybe. I'm just saying maybe. And uh, we need to lobby the province on poverty. Yes. And education is more important almost than employment. And because that creates self esteem and the ability to, to pay money or get a good paycheck. So I appreciate your question, though. But triple bottom line needs to be done together. Separating it out I, is I, isolation. I, I just want, I know you're short on time, but I just want to say really quickly I think I 100% agree with that, but I also think that there's, there's, there can, there's definitely room for both. Like I, I'm I per, just strictly in my head here. I'm seeing like an environmental committee and just representative from every committee on or from that committee on every other committee. It sounds way less bureaucratic than it, than it sounds from me saying it right now. But uh, I think it would make everybody happy. A follow up: If you look at the old minutes, when anybody was on another committee mm -hmm. and they come back, they rarely had anything to say. That's a fair you look point. at the reports; it was on nothing report because they're so busy. They're a volunteer. They forgot last week's committee. That's a very fair report. point. So the reports don't flow. That's the problem, too. Thank you. Thank you. Last word, Councilor Bestwick. Thank you. Um, thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. I, I won't talk to the poverty issue that's already been spoken about. And just as it relates to the Environment Committee, so stakeholders, staff, councillors are going to be on all of our new committees and establishing and developing the terms of reference for all of those committees over the next, whatever, one to six months. During that period of time when we give it its chance, and if any one of those committees don't materialize and work as efficiently and fluently as we thought, we need to um, move something over here and move something over there and shift this and shift that and add this and delete that. Well, that's what this is, shift is all about. So that we can create efficient uh, operations at our committee levels. It, and it doesn't mean that the way they were was wrong and way out in left field, And but it, we're just shifting. And let's give it the six months. Let, let, let's give it six months. And I'm quite happy when if the environment thing doesn't work on the six committees. I hope it does. But if it doesn't, I'm not going to decide for all of those committees if it works or not. But somebody's going to tell us, staff and councillors and stakeholders and committee members, that it's not working. Okay, then let's shift. Then let's fix what's not working. Instead of saying, it's, it's never going to work. This is so wrong. 
well, you know what, let's give this a shot. And I'll be quite happy to say everybody else was right and everybody else was wrong and we should have done this in the first place. Well, let's just give this a shot because that's what we're attempting to do is try to make it better. We're not trying to make it worse, I don't think. And if it not. is, then let's fix it because I hope we're all big enough and got enough common sense to fix it if it's not working because enough people are going to... So nobody knows it's not going to work yet. Everybody's just saying it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's just... I'm sorry. It's just not going to I think a lot of it, too, it was just was concerns, uh, maybe the message being communicated or miscommunicated or getting lost somewhere about uh, what was going to happen. I think a lot of clarity was provided tonight uh, pertaining to the committees. And uh, once again, I thank everyone for, for clarifying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cooper, take us home. Um, <clears throat> there's been a couple of questions regarding the, uh, the boathouse. So under recreation, culture, and sports, I would like to know why the boathouse proposal has not been considered oh. under recreation, culture, and sports. Mr. Cooper, we're going to finish at 930, so we don't have time to answer any more questions. You say take us home. That's the last question. So. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to wrap up. <laughs> We'll be 15 minutes uh, answering this question. Okay, so I can guarantee that. I will wrap it up by indicating that there are a number of questions that remain, and I gather there are two members of the public that haven't yet spoken. What I would encourage for the public, if you want to complete those forms, send them to me, and I'll make a note of those. And then for the questions that weren't answered, as we typically do, we will provide those answers on our website. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes our, uh, our, t our community town hall meeting for tonight. And extended it for an additional half an hour. I hope everybody at home enjoyed it and the folks that were, were here. And we're, we apologize for any uh, delays to uh, anyone else that has other business tonight. Uh, we do have our next item, which is the introduction of late items. And that is, uh, that is the uh, addition of a verbal update from Ms. Michelle Corfield, which is, the, which is the city representative on the Nanaimo Port Authority. Your Worship, would we just be able to adopt the agenda and do that stuff as well before yeah, we hear the presentation? Okay, you can so stay, no, 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 you, you can stay there, it's okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering, at, just, just a moment, I'm wondering at this time whether or not uh, what I'm showing on here, item number 7A, is still on the agenda. Yeah, they've they've had to leave your worship. Okay. So we we want to strike them from the agenda. Okay. Okay. So then we've got uh, so we've got everything else but seven eight. <sighs> no. no. The E Town Hall was um, oh, part no. of uh, it was an agenda item, so we were inside the council meeting during the E Town Hall. Number five is the only thing. Okay, so. We need a motion to adopt the agenda. I'm so moved. Moved by <laughs> Councillor Pratt. Seconded by Councillor Kipp. <laughs> Councillor Kipp. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you for being so patient with us. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Tleko Snenemo Mastayo. Uh... I'm actually honored to be here. I didn't expect to be here all night, but now I've missed my Monday night TV watching, so <laughs> which I watch you guys, so I'm here. Uh, I would like to thank you for appointing me to the Nanaimo Port Authority, and I, I am sure most of you are aware, uh, recently at a port meeting, I was uh, elected vice chair of the port, so you've had a full... Uh, change in your executive at the Nanaimo Port Authority. We have Moira Jenkins now as the president and myself as the vice chair. And that starts effective September 1st. So I want to give a little bit of an update of what we've done over the past year and give you a few of my thoughts and insights as to where I see us going. And then I'm here for questions. So 
First off, I want to say, and I'm not certain that everybody, and I don't know how this normally goes, and I don't know how this normally plays out. And your past people that sat at the Port Authority, I don't know. So I'm winging it, and hopefully I'm within the box that I'm supposed to play in. So the Port Authority conducted an economic impact study in 2014, and if you weren't aware of that, I think uh, it's a good uh, thing to have a look at. It's available on the NPA website, and it really does tell a story about what the port does for the city of Nanaimo and the central Vancouver Island area, being the single source of goods to come over from Vancouver uh, and land in Nanaimo and then have that cargo venture off into other areas of the island. And uh, one of the things I learned the other day was propane is only comes into onto Vancouver Island through the Port Authority from some reason why. But So that's a pretty important fact that I wasn't aware of and I'm not certain that we've been very upfront about what, what it is that we do at the Port Authority. And part of our strategic goals will be to communicate better what we do and what we don't do. So uh, one of the things I want to talk about is our relationship with the city itself. The port and the city traditionally have met twice a year. However, in the past 12 months, the port and the city liaison committee have met five times with the sixth meeting scheduled for July 27th. Um, and the dates were, I have the dates, uh, we had June 25th, October 16th, May 27th, December 16th, January 18th, February 24th, March 23rd, and June 21st. With a social gather, uh, and then we met uh, as a tripartite at a social gathering with the Snenemo and the city and ourselves on July 13th. So if I could say one thing that we've managed to do in the last 12 months is we've managed to meet more often to work towards a better relationship. And I think the citizens of, the, of Nanaimo need to know that, that we are working really hard to work in collaboration and to develop a relationship. And not only a relationship with and amongst ourselves, a relationship with and amongst Nanaimo at, at the table as well. And I think that going forward, that's going to be the most critical thing we can do together as a city and as a port authority is to work with our Nanaimo partner to develop a Nanaimo that is truly the best place on earth to live. And I think we can do that. And I've seen the waterfront is one or two on the strategic plan. And I think that's one of the areas that we all can collaborate on and work together, inclusive of Newcastle. Because if we can dream big and we can dream better, we can have a park in our downtown core that is equivalent to Central Park or Stanley Park. And we have to dream big and invite those conversations and we can only do that in collaboration together with the three partners sitting together, working together and sharing resources. And the reason I talk about sharing resources is because most people think that Nanaimo Port Authority is this massive big thing and even I did. Remember I challenged them on the marina. Um, the Nanaimo Port Authority has 24 employees, 10 non-union and 14 unionized members. So really we're a small organization uh, with uh, very functional staff, right? The union members are functional and the non-union members would be the management so, and support staff. So very small staff. Uh, one of the things that we do as a port authority, and it's in our letters patent, is uh, we have to contribute back to the community. This year, we've given $50,000 in cash donations and approximately $25,000 in in-kind donations. And some of the things that we've uh, supported in our community are the Vancouver Island University Foundation scholarships and acquisitions of First Nations artwork. Uh, Young Professionals of Nanaimo, BC Right to Read SFN Library, Gabriel Arts Council, Building Renos, United Way, Nanaimo Museum, Summer Bastion Program, Nanaimo Child Development Center, Silly Boat Regatta, Nanaimo Art Gallery, Festival of Banners, uh, Vancouver Island Sif Symphony, Children's Choir, Nanaimo Dragon Boat Festival, Nanaimo Lady Smith Schools Foundation, Nanaimo Aboriginal Center, Celebration of Success, and the Nanaimo Boathouse Society Paddle Fest. Um, the port in between 2008 and up to 2017 will have contributed a million dollars to the conference center. 
Um, we've committed in 2015 to 2019 $50,000 to Nanaimo Loaves and, Fi Loaves and Fishes Food Bank. So some, those are some of the things that we're supporting in the community um, as partners in the community. And I thought it's worthwhile that everybody knows what it is we're doing and who, and who we're supporting because I think it's really important that this partnership between the city and the Port Authority become more accessible and more understood by the citizens of Nanaimo. So I, that's one of the reasons uh, I want I wanted to share that is because we do believe and continue to believe that investing in Nanaimo is right as well as is the proper thing to be doing and working with Nanaimo is critical. Um, some of the things that we're trying to do this year is increase um, cargo. We're trying to work towards uh, our waterfront goals and aspirations. I think that that's going to be a challenge. Um, just because the parcels of land and them, of themselves have encumbrances and those are challenging and uh, working towards creating our marina, of course, um, is always ongoing and trying to access new money for that is uh, a priority. And I think in September we'll be able to have some solid commitment and announcements to make around what we're doing uh, in that specific area. So those are just my... That's what we've done in the last 12 months. I hope that you found that useful. And uh, any questions, I can try and answer. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to see, you know, we know that uh, everywhere we go, uh, the Port Authority is, is sponsoring something, whether it be an event or a building or an organization. And so it's nice to hear, uh, hear that laid out you know, in, in as, as well as you did. That's, that's very good. And thank you very much for taking that project on. That's a lot of work, and I know you've got a very, very busy schedule. And uh, and thank you for representing us there. Thank you. Councillor Bestwick. Thanks, Michelle, for coming to open and, and delivering that message, and congratulations. Uh, at the beginning of your uh, message, you indicated that propane uh, comes to through Nanaimo. How does it come across? To Nanaimo. I'm going to say it comes on the rail. And is the is rail the uh, being our representative uh, for the city? Could you please um, advise me, if not tonight, if rail is the only option for delivering propane to Vancouver Island? I would gladly take that back to the Port Authority and ask. Thank you very much. Uh, number two, as you mentioned, the um, contributions, mm -hmm. be it the Port Theatre or, or whatever else, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, have Has your board discussed payment in lieu of taxes uh, at any time recently in 20, as you are our representative, will you be suggesting and recommending any increases to the PILTS as we commonly refer to it as? Now that I know what PILTS are, which I've learned about over the last year. I think uh, both our organizations and staff are probably in discussion because I believe we have a renewal coming up in 217, is it not? I think, I, don't quote me, but yeah, it's I, on the radar. I, I won't quote you, but I look forward to uh, hearing more It's on more the radar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, congratulations on your appointment to vice president. Um, what, 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 what is it? Vice chair. chair. Vice chair, sorry. Um, Question I would have, I guess it's to yourself as our city rep and our staff is, I look forward to near future, um, the status of the, the three proponents on the RF, on their request for proposal on the fast ferry. Sort of haven't heard anything as a recent, so I'll, I'm hoping and crossing my fingers and it better be good news. Thank you. I think we're having a meeting on the 27th and I believe that's the only agenda item. Councillor Hong. Um, thank you. Thanks for coming and giving us an update. Um, I love it when our community partners come and give us updates, especially in open, so the <coughs> public can hear what you have to say that we as council and, and you as MPA are working together. Um, a question I have for you is when I look at Google Earth, mm -hmm. in Nanaimo, the Port Authority lands are predominantly what shows this big empty piece of concrete. So my question is, are you guys going to plan on doing anything? Is it just going to sit there as concrete? We know that you can't use it for wood because it's going to sink. So 
can you guys do something with it so we can do like want to give some land for a community garden to use I know it's federal land or whatever you guys want to do but it'd be great that if you're not using the land I know that we use it for our float every year thank you very much for that space but there's a lot of land there and I know that RCMP use it for training sometimes but if we can utilize some of that land that would be great and I, and I know that I don't know the protocol, but if you can take it back to the board, maybe let out to our community partners, know that you guys can have some land that people can use for specific events. That would be great. So we are having a strategic planning session uh, in the mid middle of August, and I will bring that forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see no further questions. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very again. much. Too. Thank you for your patience. Can we have a motion to receive the delegation, please? Moved by Councillor Bestwick and seconded by Councillor Th uh, Pratt. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. Those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Your Worship. Councillor Kett. Uh, just to Councillor Bestwick's thing, some 600 propane cars a year come through the port. Um, other methods come through, just regular <coughs> truck. Regular truck and trailer come through all the time. In fact, on um, December 14, 2001, Carrier Princess in a big windstorm had a propane tanker flipped over, and we wouldn't allow it into the harbor because we have no ability to deal with that type. And because of the superstructure on the Carrier Princess, it couldn't be lifted until it went back to Delta Port. But we have limited response, but we use that product. Everybody uses it in barbecues and whatever else. And so it's some 600 cars a year, and most hazardous material and dangerous cargo go through Nanaimo for Vancouver Island. Nothing goes through the Victoria port for dangerous cargo, and it all comes through Nanaimo. So. Thank you. Just some background. Was, paid more than was the delegation received? Thank you. All right, next item. Agenda item 11A. I see it's noted twice here on both uh, the front page and on the last page. Is there any reason for that? I think you're looking at your annotated agenda, Your Worship, that only you get. Oh, pardon me. Yes, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So the next one is question period. Agenda items only. Les Barkley, Nanaimo, Your Worship and Council, I have... Two questions pertaining to agenda item 6A tonight, the uh, E-Town Hall meeting. Question one, um, I'm just wondering uh, what uh, ensued from Councillor Yoakum's suggestion that there be a subsequent E-Town Hall related to the strategic, uh, the updated strategic plan. Well, that was not a motion as far as I could uh, recall. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I was more. I, can, I said I had to make it a motion, or you know, just like the Tracy, that I think, or, or direction. It was a suggestion. It wasn't a motion. So. No, I, that, 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 I, did, I didn't say it was a, a motion, but but a suggestion. I'm just wondering uh, if there will be a subsequent uh, E Town Hall, because uh, it seems from tonight that uh, many members of the community would like to uh, have uh, additional input into the updated strategic plan. I think council would be prepared to discuss that, certainly. Okay. And second question relates to the, uh, on the website, uh, the fourth point of governance renewal. Um, I just have a simple question. The, it says the city aims to adopt a new public meeting parliamentary procedures bylaw to improve efficiency. And I'm just wondering what that is. All I could find was uh, February 2014, there was a discussion at a council meeting and a, a report that uh, I don't know what became of that. That's all I know. So we have the 2000, <laughs> I talk about this all the time, the 2013 Watson report and it made recommendations on governance and so um, we've started the process of updating the procedures bylaw which is the parliamentary procedures uh, for council meetings, a consultant has been retained and we'll be doing surveys of council and the public. Uh, we've pushed that out because 
We're taking extra time on strategic planning. We've got engagement on the committee structure. We're going to have engagement on the core services. And then we also have this parliamentary procedure bylaw. So it's going to happen over the next three or four months, public input, public engagement. We might have a session in August, a workshop. So it's, it's, it's a matter of making space in a crammed uh, four-month period where there's a need for consultation and public engagement on a wide range of things, which is we're going to use the e-town halls, we're going to go around the community, these are the recommendations that are coming to council. Um, the session may not be like tonight where it's exclusively on one topic. It may be possible to have more than one topic on uh, a public engagement thing. So that's, that's what it's referring to is the update of the procedure bylaw. And, and, and where can I find out more about this uh, new bylaw? It's not even well, draft. It's this, not. It's not draft. This bylaw in, in process or updated. Well, it's it. Nothing has happened to the procedure bylaw, so it's the one that you get. Num bylaw number blah blah blah, and so the first all that's been done is a questionnaire developed, and I given see. to council and given to staff, and then there's going to be a questionnaire for the public, and then there's going to be sessions, and then there's going to be ideas, and then they'll be drafting. So there's no new bylaw. It's we're at the questionnaire phase. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and there'll be, but in future, there'll be more information about this on the city website. Yeah, I guess I don't know what we're designing in terms of a public engagement platform, but there should be a questionnaire, input, all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And can you, can you, can you or, or someone on council explain what, why efficiency was chosen? Normally, we, we don't speak of parliamentary procedure about being about efficiency, you know, as, as a big word. Yeah, I guess it can be loaded in many different senses, but um, I think what we're talking about there is the procedure bylaw affects council, it affects the community, and it affects staff because it sets out the time frames and the timelines to set agendas, to get the materials ready, to get them out to the public in a timely way so that when a council meeting's coming, nobody's getting it at the last minute. So it's about effectively and efficiently running your resources inside. So you've got timelines that people can make, that they're not too onerous that they can't make those types of things. So I think in that sense is what it's talking about. Okay. Uh, uh, one, one, a third question, not related to this. Uh, I missed the beginning of tonight's meeting, but I saw item 7A on the agenda referred to the, the Van Cruellen Convention Center hotel feasibility study. I was hoping that that would be discussed in the open meeting tonight. Has that been postponed to a subsequent meeting? We ran out of time, unfortunately, so we'll be looking at putting it back on as soon as possible. I think one consultant will be available in person and the other one we may just have to um, have her dial in. So absolutely. Okay. Just ran out of time. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Before you go, uh, the procedure bylaw for you want for uh, is actually 7060. 7060? Yeah, okay. That's our procedure bylaw. All right. You can find that on our website. I think he's quoted from it. <laughs> okay. Well, Thank you. And the, uh, and the Watson report, you can get that off of our search engine on our website as well. Yes, I've looked at that. Watson Governance Framework Summary Report. Cool. Thank you. Councillor Kip. Um, how was this as a public session? Because I know you've asked, and I've brought forward a, a thing to try and put through these my town hall or community town halls. I, I didn't like a, a, a citizen asking a question two or three minutes, and then the answer is taking 15 minutes. That uh, that didn't seem a very efficient use of a uh, e town hall. That was uh, my main main complaint. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Good evening. Don Bonner of Farm on East Wellington. Um, I, I want to thank Councillor Yoakum for bringing up the idea of more e town hall meetings. I think that Council can never have enough input from the public and the decisions that they make. I have two questions tonight regarding the e town hall meeting. Uh, the first one is on agriculture and sustainable uh, food production. And I noticed that as the people were talking about agriculture, and you'll notice that on your Facebook page, there's a lot of people talking about this issue. 
the person who was going through the five priorities couldn't find out which one kind of was for the agricultural stuff because it's actually not listed on the priorities. And so since there's been a lot of people talking about it and there's been a lot of talk on Facebook regarding sustainable um, food production and agriculture, is council willing to relook at their five priorities and perhaps include it so that it is actually listed and becomes a priority and not a pamphlet on a city website? I would say that all the members of council would agree with that. Uh, the, the idea of having these uh, e-town hall meetings is, exact, is for exactly that reason, to consider everything, including what we might have missed. Well, that would be the first for council agreeing with me on that. But anyway, question number two is regarding the environmental committee. And uh, I've also been following the questions, the uh, statements on, on your Facebook page regarding the environment, environmental committee. Um, I've listened to people who are actually on the environmental committee and I've been watching people in the audience when the environmental committee was talking about and there's more people who are disagree with council's decision to disband the committee than actually agree with the committee which would be the seven people on council. So my question to council is now that the e-town hall meeting has finished and that you do have the input from the public, is council willing to now relook at disbanding the environmental committee now that the overwhelming majority of people who have talked about it are opposed to council doing this? No, well, Councillor Fuller. Ever heard of the vocal minority? Um, I'm not sure the if that's an answer majority? to my question. Well, you've had uh, three or four people have mentioned it tonight. No, no. Um, yeah. I can tell you that there's an awful lot more than three or four people. My question was, I, is well, council... I'm talking here. Okay. At the, at the E-Town Hall, it was mentioned three or four times. Uh, we discussed the food sustainability as well. Yeah, so all of these things are priorities. The... Uh, Committee stuff will come up. More stuff is coming out on it. Feel free to uh, come in with even more people, and we'll see what happens. It's up to a majority of council to make that decision. It's not up to me or the mayor or anybody else. So based on the input from the E-Town Hall meeting, then it's the council's decision that is actually their decision, and all of the information that we gave you regarding the Environmental Committee is like whistling in the wind. <laughs> For some, okay. So, Ms. Samra. I just would point out that there's um, a process that council has approved, which is to have a sit down. Um, well, there's a whole bunch of different steps that are going to take place. So, um, it is back in October when the committee members will come back with recommendations and changes for council to consider. And definitely the input that we're getting on the website, because it's part of the strategic plan, will be considered. We'll incorporate that into any discussion things that come forward to council. Um, there's going to be a convening of the ACES uh, committee members in the next couple of weeks to have a discussion with them. I've heard back from some of those members, and they've identified what committees they want to go to. So we'll have that conversation. Then there'll be a sit-down with each of the new committees to give them all of the terms of reference and get them in starting a dialogue. I don't think that that can be achieved in just August. I think they're going to have to go through into September and probably have more meetings. And then we can have that information, bring it back to these guys, and then they can decide what to do with it. So I still think there's time for more consultation, more input, and certainly as from a staff perspective, hearing what we hear and looking at the websites and the comments that come in, we will absolutely consider those and put that in into the mix. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pratt. Oh, he's gone. Doesn't matter. Okay. Next. Good evening. My name is Deward Manny Rafton. I came to this country when I was 10 and a half years old. I'm an immigrant in this country. I love this country. I came here April 1st, 1980, and I love this town. I Lived in Kitimat. I grew up in Kitimat. <coughs> I lived in Vancouver. I lived in Edmonton. I lived in Toronto. And I always, I always come back here. And um, 
I'm disappointed to say you people are not doing a very good job. I mean, uh, the last time I came to a constable meeting, I mean, this is a town hall meeting. I look at, there's more of you than there's pe people from the town. What does that tell you? You guys can't even get along with yourselves. So what did that say? You know, I've talked to you. I've talked to you, Mr. McGregor. I'm sir. talking here. You know, sir, I'm 70. Yeah. Sir. I'm going to be 70 years old. Sir. So I got, I mean, I, I've got seniority here. Sir, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Can we have I'm, a question? I'm please? ashamed of the way you people are running this town. I came to the meetings when when uh, Mr. Nay was a counselor, and we had Mr. Allen, who sabotaged every sir, meeting. Sir, do you have a question got, for us? Yes, sir. About tonight's agenda. Okay, it's a town hall meeting. Where's the town? Huh? Well, then, thank God I got so here, Jerry. I mean, I'd be disappointed if I didn't say my piece. You know me, I say my piece. I spoke, I spoke to, sir, to uh, sir, were, the mayor the other over, day. Sir, my, sir. Uh, my sister was dying in Vancouver. I'm the oldest of six. I've had two sisters die. I parked the car where I've been parking for 30 years. The city, in their wisdom, sir, do you have a question? Take that car away for it. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Your Worship, there's Pardon just an me. item of correspondence on the agenda. That's correct. Move to receive. Seconded. Discussion. Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Bestwick, seconded by Councillor Hong. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries.